Hey guys, do you see me? Hey. Hey guys, do you see me? <clears throat> I'm going to unmute everybody. Uh, so I'm just muting, unmuting, uh, unmuting all of you. And I know some of you are signing on. Hey, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Mark just joined. I'm joining via phone. I will be uh, okay. behind the computer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we are ju we're just starting up. Uh, we have a few people joined already, and a couple are joining in. And we should start in just a minute as soon as everybody's here. We are expecting a uh, total six people. Uh, and me, so that will be seven. We are using Zoom conference, and by the way, one important thing I would like you to know that we are recording this uh, right now, which means uh, the uh, the state of Washington requires us to tell everybody that we are actually recording this, uh, which basically is a law that says that you should tell everybody that you're recording a conversation. So I just told you that that we are recording this, and we, why we record this is primarily to help you get a copy of the video that we we run the program. So the video file becomes available to you so you can rewind and repeat if you miss a session or something or if you want to catch up with something else or you want to connect back and relate back to what was discussed you can always do that so that's the one thing that is the reason the primary reason is for recording is to uh, give you the ability to roll back rewind repeat until you get the concept that we discussed oh i know uh, we still are waiting for we have one two three four people we're waiting for two more and they'll be coming online soon. Uh, I am just pinging them on Slack chat. Uh, David is going to join in just a second. I'm going to send him a link so that he knows how to get in. And just sending him that link. David, please join. And who else is missing? We have Diego is missing. Diego was there earlier this afternoon with me. We chatted briefly and he, he probably ran into the same traffic I did on the way home. Uh uh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, I think uh, we have David joined. We have uh, Mark, David, Dennis, Mukesh, Ram, and Diego. Diego is missing, uh, but uh, traffic. So, yeah, no worries. No worries. No big worries. Yeah, traffic is going to be there as a problem. But whatever, let's uh, let's keep moving. Okay, so first thing first. Welcome. Hi, my name is Nilesh, and I will be running the program just like this. And I have three different modes of uh, this screen presentation. One of them is this one, this camera that I use to just say hi. But that's not how we run the program. This is just to say hi. The main program runs like this. I'm actually showing you my screen. And in, in that screen, you will see that I am actually projecting my laptop. And you see me in a little corner here, right? In the side corner, you see me there. And so that's the dominant uh, usage is how we will run the program where I'm basically sharing my laptop. And sometimes you share your screens. And you know, to share your screen is very easy. Just go to the bottom, look at the green colored button. And uh, there you will hit and start projecting your screen whenever you want to, uh, as, as, as and when needed. So uh, this, this, uh, this OneNote application is what uh, I think most of you have already set up. It has, uh, we, are, we are intending to use this as our whiteboard. And this whiteboard synchronizes with you. You see it here. And what, what happens is as, as this whiteboard synchronizes, you retain a copy of this on your OneNote application, which is available to you in Mac and you know, PC and all that. So you will use it. And you will also have a section, which is a shared section, where you will uh, you know, basically share notes with other people like this. Like I'm, I'm doing right now. I'm writing some scribbling something. And you can also scribble. Or you can type if you feel like. I'm going to erase those scribblings. Uh, the scribblings are not really important. But that's the shared space. We also have an individual one-on-one -on -one space. For example, this is a dummy student who is not really a student. He's actually my son. And so he and I are going to share notes. And this is between him and me. And that is a one-on-one -on -one section. If you have access to that section as an instructor, you will be able to see it. 
but if you are a student uh, participating in the program, it will be a one-on-one -on -one discussion that you have in that dedicated section, which is also available to you. In addition to that, there are several things that I think most of you have done already, and the logistics of it. The logistics are simple. You know that already, but I'm going to repeat this, which is, you know, the dates that we have. These are the dates. And these dates are basically Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays over the next eight weeks. And the timings are 5 o'clock to 8 p.m. That is on Tuesday, Thursday. So on the, on the weekdays, we have these times in the evening hours. And on the weekend, Saturday, it is going to be morning, 8 o'clock. Yeah, sometimes it is too early, especially as winter kicks in. This is going to be too early for some of you, but yeah, whatever. Live with it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, but that's the schedule. And the meeting happens just like this, like you, you, you're doing right now with me. You will uh, have multiple platforms, Android, you know, iOS, Windows, PC, Surface, all these machines. You can use Zoom conference just comfortably. And I have used it many, many times, many, many, uh, I think it's like 30 years we are using Zoom. It works beautifully. And uh, there's a new tool from Microsoft going to come out very soon. It's called uh, Skype for Business uh, Broadcast. And as soon as it is enabled for us, we will start using it. So we're waiting for that. Uh, next up, we also have a chat method that many of you have already set up. This chat is basically, let's see if everybody's here. No, Diego is still missing. But chat is this uh, Slack chat that we use, and this runs all the time. I mean, 24 hours. We have people monitoring it for me that help me in answering your questions. If, you, if, if like sometimes what happens is people are out of this out of this time zone, people from other countries sometimes participate, and in that case, you will have a situation where you know people need help. People do their work on their assignments or whatever they are doing on their own on their projects. Uh, if they need help, they come here to chat on on Slack chat. I will. I would like to caution you one thing. This this general section in the upper area here is open to public. This section general. So don't chat anything private there. It is not a good idea. If you want to chat private, chat one on one, like with me here. Chat with me. Now this is me chatting with me. It's just an example. Uh, you can also chat with me. I think most of you have chatted with me privately. So just just caution. Don't go to the public channel and post private messages. You can you can post public messages, but not private. Don't do that. We will also create a private group for just all of us to chat interactively if we need to. So that's the Slack chat. We have a couple other things also. For example, we have uh, Office 365 subscription that I think most of you have set up already. We have a Gmail subscription uh, from Google Apps that you have set up already. And also Cloud Genius Access. Uh, this access is available to us through this location. I'm just adjusting the pointer here. And if you go to that site, this, this, by the way, you should have access to this note itself also. If you do not have access to this note, uh, at least one person doesn't have it. I think, uh, who doesn't have Den yeah, David may not have access. So yeah, we should set it up. So I will walk you through quickly how to set things up and I will give you your passwords if you don't have them. And the idea would be, first thing first, go to this site, portal.office.com. And I'm going to post that link for you. So in Slack chat, I'm going to post these links uh, right now uh, for general. In the general forum, I'm posting these links. Uh, so that's where these links will pop up, portal.office.com. And here you log in using a password that I will provide to you one-on-one -on -one in your one-on-one -on -one chat. And there you log in you log into this location, like I'm going to log in right now. And when I log in, you will see that <clears throat> I am going to type in my password and then wait for a second factor authentication if needed. And then it will let me in into the office portal. This is the Office 365 subscription. The key thing that I am using here is Classroom, which is a new preview product from Microsoft coming up again. It like started couple months ago for me. Uh, and so we started, we decided to use it. I like it very much. The reason I like it is that, let me give you a link first. So you go to that location, aka.ms slash classroom. That link will take you to the classroom location. This is a new preview product called Microsoft Classroom that is coming out, made available to educational institutions like us. And so here we have this Cloud Bootcamp. 
Inside there, we have a notebook. And that notebook is what I am using right now to launch a notebook. It launches first in the browser. And then once it is opened in the browser, I can then incorporate that into the OneNote application. So I'm going to edit that in OneNote and it opens up OneNote just like you have seen already. This application OneNote opens up and shows the content. It has the section that we have been discussing already. So after having done that, we go to Google, gmail.com and there you sign in and you go access your, uh, <coughs> your uh, you access your email, which is hosted currently at Gmail. So quick, quick overview of what are we talking about in a nutshell? What I'm going to do is go to the instructor from instructor page and here I want to open a new sheet of paper and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what did I just say? What we are really doing is that we are giving you access to the Cloud Genius content. This is a content library that we have and that we are regulating that access through a centralized Azure Active Directory. This is where credentials are stored. It also gives you access to Office 365 subscription. And the same credentials are also used for Google Apps subscription. The idea that we have is to not make you remember multiple different passwords, but instead just use one. Actually, there are two. I'm just, just telling you there are two right now. One password is separate for Slack, which is not integrated yet. So there's a separate Slack password that is used for chat, and you probably have it as your personal email or some company email, but not the Cloud Genius email. And this credential is actually your own first name, dot last name, at Cloud Genius. And that is your login name. It also is a school account. It gives you email access, bunch of other things. We'll talk more about it at a later time, but that's the overall picture. Centralized credentials, access to multiple sites, office services, Google services, and Cloud Genius content. What is Cloud Genius content? It is actually a reference library that we have built over the years, which is looks like this. I will now go into the library itself you can access that library by going to the dashboard section. Here, on the left side, there is this dashboard button. You click on that, and that's where you will find all the courses that you are registered for. And I see a lot of courses I am registered for because I created them, but you will probably see three eventually. You'll see right now only one. And I think some of you won't even see anything because you just signed up, so I have to still go to the back end and enable you. So you will eventually see the course called Cloud Technologies. And that course is right there. And this has a ton of content available to you as a reference material. Think of this as your textbook. Uh, and I promise not to bore you with too much uh, video content, of long video content, but there is, there, is, there is some short videos. I keep my videos focused on like five to seven minutes. And so there are really, really short focused topical videos on certain things that I want to talk about, like here is one of them. And I'm not going to play these here, but instead these are reference for you to watch later, whenever you have time, and you just follow along. This is broadly the sequence that we intend to follow, but not necessary. We don't have to stick to this sequence. We are open and we keep microphones open. I think I have made sure that your microphones are unmuted. So I think you have muted them apparently. So it is okay at any time to just open your microphone and talk. And that's a great thing that I want to enable you is to anytime you have a question, you just ask away. And so I'm actively going to open the microphones and keep them open just like a physical location face to face. Unless you want to mute it yourself, which is a different case. So I'm going to unmute everybody right now. It might cause some noise. If, if it does, I'll tell you who's causing noise. So don't worry about it. So I'm going to unmute everybody and you are free to mute yourself. As a, at this moment, everybody is unmuted, so you can actually speak up. And I would encourage you to just introduce yourself maybe one at a time, beginning with me. Hi, I'm Nilesh. And now let's go alphabetical order. I will choose the order beginning with David Rivera. Hi, David. Hey, Nilesh. David Rivera here. Glad to be here. Good to see you. Good to see you. We also have uh, Dennis. Uh, Dennis, uh, hi. Hi, everyone. If you guys can hear me. Yes, we can. How are you, Dennis? Oh, great. Uh, I'm glad to be here. 
Good to see you. Good to see you. Let's go to the next one. I think Diego just joined. Hi, Diego. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Absolutely. Love to be, love to have you here. By the way, Diego is from University of Michigan, my school. I just discovered it randomly out of the blue and I was looking up, lurking on his LinkedIn profile and he turned out to be from University of Michigan. Go blue. Awesome. Good choice. Thank you. And next one is Mark Myers. Hey, Mark. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, we can. It is working. Great. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you, sir. And by the way, uh, just quickly checking in, is the audio okay? Can you see me properly? Are you able to see my screen as such? Is my face showing? Do you want to see me or do you not want to see me? I can <laughs> it, like, go away completely. Like, oh, you not watching me, Nilesh. Uh-huh. You look great. Okay. So if you want, if you prefer this mode versus that mode, you tell me which one do you prefer? And I will, I will switch accordingly. I also have a third mode, which is this one which is just to say hi to everybody. That's it. That's the only purpose of this mode. Otherwise, I most of the time use this mode, which is probably more practical for what we intend to do. I I don't think you are here to see my face, honestly. And so, yeah, let's keep going. So we have another person, Mukesh. Hi, Mukesh. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. How are you doing? Very good. Very glad to be here. And I do like to see your face. So be there. Okay. <laughs> I will show you my face in that case. And uh, since I think all of us, all uh, it is very rare, but all of us happen to be in our Seattle area. So that's a great thing. Maybe we can meet face to face at some point, uh, maybe for coffee or lunch or something. We'll be figuring out. We have one more person, Ram. Uh, hi, Ram. How are you doing? Hey, guys. Hope you guys can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great and I'm excited to be here and learn all the great things about cloud computing. Awesome. 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 Good to see you. Good to see all of you. So we have a short focus group. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, everybody here online. That is awesome. And let us understand at this moment, any questions if you have at this moment about logistics, things to proceed or anything else that you may have missed, or like some of you may have questions about the workstation and why is it not downloading, things of that nature. So I'll, I'll highlight some of those issues as, you, as we go along. However, we don't need the workstation right now. We don't need it today, but it is going to be there and it's going to be available to you. The method we use to send this workstation to you is like this. What we have is a method of using P2P protocol. So there is a P2P protocol that you probably know as BitTorrent. Uh, That protocol is what we use to send content out to everybody. So all these participants that are using uh, Cloud Genius resources, uh, anybody who wants to get the virtual machine is actually going to receive this file. This file actually sits in multiple places. Like for example, this is the folder containing the workstation. This is an OVA file. This OVA file is open virtualization format, open virtualization archive, and that is what you will receive using the P2P method of synchronization. So it's not really centralized. I should not draw it as central picture. It's like any any to any communication. So this originates from me and it goes to anybody. So there are tons of people actually right now who may be sharing this. So I have this link sync software running that is sending this particular OVA file to to anybody who's interested. And people come online to this site and go to the workstation link at that location. And that is where people will be able to download this OVA. This OVA is available here. You need to get through the sync method. That's the only method I currently have for you to receive that. We have used open source all along. And as a consequence, we use Oracle VirtualBox. And some of you want to prefer, you know, use some other <clears throat> virtualization technology that might work. I'm not sure if it works or not, but it might work. So you're open to doing that. Since this is open virtualization format, I think VMware will support that. I know at least one person wants to use VMware and that's okay. Now that virtual machine application, which is VirtualBox is open source available from Oracle that you already have. Most of you have downloaded already, nice. Next thing, you need to get the synchronization software, which is available from this location, which is this this company called Resilio Sync. It's a new name. It used to be called BitTorrent Sync before. 
and that is the free download that we use and that application looks like this and that's what will uh, show up in your computer which are actually sync it is actually synchronizing for this machine doesn't have bit torrent sync too much and so that is what we will do to get to this OVA file, this orange object that we have. It's a two GB item, this one, two gigabytes. Now, what does that thing do? This OVA file, uh, what it will do is you have to import that OVA file, OVA, you import that into a VM software. Like VirtualBox, for example, is one such application that will comfortably support it. And so once you import that, it becomes a virtual machine. How does it look like? It looks like this. It's coming up. So this is the old machine manager. And here, I'm going to start the machine. It's just a Linux machine. Actually, I shouldn't say just a Linux machine. It has a ton of applications, ton of open source libraries, and all the tools that we intend to use in the program are already preloaded. And I update this machine quite often. So whenever I have a new idea or incorporate something, machine updates, OS updates, I keep them up to date. And the P2P method I described pushes out these changes to anybody who's interested. So we have many people actually use it and that updated changes push down, get pushed out to people who are actually using that virtual machine that looks like this. And in here, you can use terminal, browser, bunch of other services. And uh, the, the one thing that I would like to say about this machine is to not starve it for memory. Don't starve it. It needs memory to work. So if you have like a 4 GB machine on your PC or Mac, you want to give this machine at least 2 GB. That's going to be okay. If you have more, no problem, give it more. But I have deliberately chosen to keep the default image machine memory size to about 1.5 GB. It's a deliberately shrunk machine. So that most people who have a 4 GB old Windows laptop can actually comfortably work with it. So it works, but be generous and increase the memory allocation to that machine so that it actually works nicely for you. Right now, my memory allocation is 1536. I'm starving it. My available RAM is heavy. And if you can see my available RAM is pretty nice. Uh, it's our 16 GB there, but I'm not giving it even 2 GB and that's a bad thing. But this is by default. So I just imported a default machine and that's what I'm doing. So I will eventually change it. So I'm going to shut down the VM and then increase the RAM available to it by going to the settings section and going to system, adding some memory, like I'm going to give it some 8192 if you can, or 4096 is good enough, but you don't even have to. You just 2048 RAM is good enough for the machine. That's the basic I would suggest. Even 1.5 GB will work, but don't make it crawl. It'll, it'll, you, you will feel uh, frustrated with it. So that's the reason I want to bring it up for discussion. Give it some love. So that's the bottom line of the machine. If you give memory, it'll, it'll perform nicely. That's good. If you have an uh, issue running the VM itself, then call me. I will fix it. Uh, we have some instructions available on that site here that if you have a particular thing, get stuck, do this, do that. So lots of written down steps are already available, but don't worry, just call me, I'll fix that. So we will do a remote session on your machine, uh, understand what's going on and find a solution for you to get to the virtual workstation working correctly. So that's the workstation part. Let's see what else we have. In uh, the, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so here we have 10 people currently synchronizing that machine right now. We have most of us. Yeah, so I think most of you have machines, except I don't see two people. Yeah, so if you don't have a machine, get it by uh, tonight, tomorrow, you should have it. And if you run into any problem, you, have, you know how to contact me. My information is available right in the front page of this sheet, right there. So you can always just connect with me. If you need something, come on Slack chat or Zoom, Zoom conference one-on-one, -on -one, we can do that all the time. Having said, any questions about just the logistics of it, dates, timings, methods, uh, access, content access? I know, I know I have to solve the content access problem for you. Some of you don't have that access, but I will, after the session is over, I will give you access 
to the dashboard section, which is where you go to see the registered courses you are registered for. For example, the cloud technology segment here, this content is going to be available to you. Um, by, by the end of the session, I will open it up. So you will have a reference for you to read through. If you need something like right now, tell me. If you need anything else that you want to ask away, please go ahead before I, I jump into the meat of the discussion I want to have. And also one thing that I keep forgetting is to take a break. And people remind me that, you know, I forget to take a break. So if you think that there is a need for a short break, five to 10 minutes, please tell me anytime. We can take the break. No big deal. Just tell me. Hey, Nilesh, break. Nilesh, yes. Uh, where, is, where was this content once again? How this, did you content, get this content is available on this location. I just pasted on a general group in Slack chat. Uh, it is Cloud Genius site slash dashboard. So this dashboard link, that's where the content is going to pop up after you log in through Active Directory like I described here. Sorry. Like here, I described this method of, uh, of, uh, of Azure AAD, your credentials. I think most of you have this credential already, this Crowd Genius email address and the login password combination. I think you have that already. So you will use that to centrally log into Azure AD with your credential. And then you have access to the content in the dashboard. You have access to Office 365 services and Google apps. And you know, some of us like Google, others don't like Google, but I don't care. I like both. I like both Office and Google. So I have both for you. So if you want to use Google, go ahead and use Google. If you want to use Office 365, go ahead and use the, that one. I don't care. All we care about is learning. So we will use that, but use multiple services as in when we need to. And uh, uh, some of you may find it interesting, those who are, you know, those who tend to like Google, is that Google is offering unlimited storage. Yes, it is hard to believe, but uh, check this out. I know. I know we have some Microsoft fans and Microsoft employees long time. So yeah, you don't have to look. But the point is that they're giving it to us and Microsoft gives you like a terabyte. These guys compete and give unlimited. So it may be interesting to some people and it's going to be there. I'm using like 4.9, 4.5 terabytes. And so it is up to us as to what you want to use. This is available to you as a subscription available. Thank Google for me. And don't thank me, thank Google. Uh, they have given it to educational institutions. So all educational institutions, big universities and small companies like us who are licensed to operate like an educational institution have this privilege uh, from Google as well as uh, similar privileges from Office 365. So both thank both Microsoft and Google for their generosity. I think these companies are doing great, both of them. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Uh, and you ask a quick question? Yes, sir. That image that comes from the, the sync system, will it always sync up before rebooting or is there a way I can yeah. save the image locally without having to continuously download? So uh, that was, was that David speaking or? Yes, sir. Okay, so the, the, the question is about this, this image that pops up in your, uh, what, in your folder, right? That right. P2P network will basically put that OVA file inside a folder. It right. automatically right. updates only the image. It does not by itself venture out and goes to the VM. No, you have to do the import manually. It doesn't want to disturb you. You have to import a fresh OVA. I will tell you at some point that I'm going to update the OVA. And one fine morning, I'll tell you that I have updated the OVA, which means your folder, this one, will change its content and you will magically receive a new OVA. It is go it's going to be sitting in your folder. You have to basically decide to import or to not import. What you don't have a choice is whether I update or not, because I will update. I'm telling you right now, I will update. And so this OVA is going to get updated sometime. If I run into a problem, I will fix it. And I will push the change out to everybody, which means everybody gets a new OVA. Now, whether you import it or not, your choice. No, I was just curious because I downloaded it before the class started. Then I shut down the VM and then I, I reinitiated it and, it and it started importing more. I mean, yeah. it started so to be imported you, again. You import the OVA only one time. Okay. You don't do it over and over. 
uh, you import it one time and you use in the VM. You don't have to import it over and over unless I tell you, hey, there is an updated OVA. Or if you run into a problem with the VM that you make a mistake here and you cause trouble, you, that's okay. You know, you, you could cause trouble. In that case, you delete this VM completely and import another v OVA and you get a fresh VM. That's the idea you said scenario. So pretty much you will go to this virtual machine software, which is called virtual box. And here- I guess uh, David is referring to uh, the sync service must be running the uh, resilient. Aha, resilient so, needs to run yeah, all the time. It doesn't, yeah, it, doesn't downloading. CPU. it doesn't tax CPU much. It yeah. just keeps on running in the background doing nothing. It is just checking if there is any updated yeah. content. If there is a change, it will bring it down. That's it. That's the purpose of the 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 BitTorrent sync, uh, get sync, uh, Resilio sync application. It uh, it just brings content to your machine because it's a one one to many communication, right? I'm pushing content out to everybody, and so you are receiving it. That's the only purpose of that sync client for your machine. Okay. It, you receive content through the network. You keep it running so that you keep receiving fresh content. If you turn it off, uh, you may not receive updates. The updates do not automatically reach the VM, no. It is not like Ubuntu update, Windows update, Mac update. It is not like that. It is just the OVA updates. I will eventually reach that point where I'm going to update your VM itself, but not there yet, not there yet. We'll, we'll get to that point at some point. Okay. So, uh, uh, that's about this uh, sharing of this uh, memory allocation, like I mentioned. And any other questions about logistics or access or anything else before we start a discussion? And by the way, if one of you can just remind me to take a break, that'll be awesome. Anytime, maybe every hour, maybe one and a half hours, because three hours can be long for some people. And uh, taking a break, just a five minute chart, minute, 10 minute break is a good thing. I tend to forget. Okay, let's get. Uh, the discussions started. So uh, we started today already. So let, let's uh, uh, say one thing. I uh, tend to not use any PowerPoint or any pre-recorded, pre-written material, but instead I will refer to the content that we have already on that site, like I mentioned here, occasionally. And you're also welcome to re read that. You have access to it already, or you will have access to it by later tonight. Uh, what I'm going to do is to get a look at the overall overview, tell you what we'll be covering today and make sure that we actually do and then uh, open for questions and questions are welcome anytime. So having said, let's begin with a new sheet of paper. And what we intend to do discuss today is a couple of things just to understand basic definition, uh, definition of what cloud computing is, who defines it, what exactly it means, why are we doing this program? Why do we do the bootcamp? What are we going to get benefit out of it? Like the why, why this bootcamp, what, what's the benefit to us? And also uh, some uh, classification of uh, classification of cloud computing, what types, uh, what service models we have, service models, and uh, look at the industry in the ecosystem, who's doing what in the industry players, what are they doing, what services they provide, and how consumers, on the other hand, consumers of these cloud services, uh, how are they consuming these services from the industry players, what are the usage models, what are the dominant forces, and focus remains on open source, which means we don't really care whether it is a service provided by Microsoft or Azure or uh, Amazon or Google or I don't know how many other providers are there. We don't really care about which company provides those services, but instead we care about the end user customer that these consumers might have. And ultimately the customer is the king, right? Like, like all of us know already. So we focus on the customer, focus on their problems and identify how do we solve these problems in the context of using cloud. So that's the overall agenda that we will be covering in, in, in the next, maybe today and the next time and, and go deeper in every aspect of what we just discussed or uh, from, a, from an outline perspective in understanding cloud technologies segment. In the cloud technology segment, as we know, uh, there are three parts to this uh, bootcamp. So there are three parts 
the first part is about technology. The second part is about focusing in depth on DevOps. And the third part is architecture focused. So in the technology section, we will go breadth and uh, understand what's available out there, services, classification of cloud services, service models, uh, the classic definition of who defines cloud computing and what is the definition, what does it mean? Is this a cloud service or not? How do you know what, what is private cloud, what is public cloud? How do we define, distinguish, differentiate? And how is data center different from private cloud and things of that nature? So we'll understand those concepts and then uh, go deeper into studying a variety of technologies available in the open source domain and identify key players out there in the industry like Azure or AWS or, uh, you know, track space used to be big, but not anymore. Google Cloud is, you know, gaining traction. There are a bunch of other smaller companies that are also gaining traction and use tools and technologies available in the breadth section. Then in the second section, we go deeper and we dive deep using a couple of tools like Chef, for example, and also Ansible as a tool. These two tools will take us uh, to quite a level of depth that you may or may not have anticipated in as you signed up for the program, but this is going to uh, be very, very deep and very, very nerdy. Let me caution you, it's going to be nerdy, this DevOps section. It is going to be nerdy because it will be all Linux, like all Linux, no Windows, no Mac, just Linux. And it will be using open source tools, Chef, Ansible, and Docker. Docker, as you know, is another very beautiful product. All of cloud services that Cloud Genius runs are Dockerized, meaning we are Docker containers, we run Docker containers. Uh, the website that we have runs in Docker and bunch of, we'll talk more about how we run and, and you will also run these tools yourself. And this workstation that you have has uh, Docker built in. So you can actually play with it right now if you are familiar with it a little bit. You can actually start experimenting already. And uh, we, are, we are open, to, I, I encourage those experimentations all the time. So that's what we will do, go deeper in this scenario to actually take an example application and implement something concrete and, and you will know once you have, once you start doing it. And you will be doing a ton of exercises in those DevOps section. We'll understand how companies use it, uh, what makes it interesting to businesses. And uh, one, uh, one thing I, I, I keep uh, reminding myself, if I am speaking too fast, ask me to slow down. I have Indian accent. If you do not understand my accent, please tell me so. I will improve and I will make sure that you can at least understand what I'm saying. Anytime if you don't get me, it will be a good idea to just ask me to, hey Nilesh, can you tell me again? Can you say that again? I did not understand. I cannot hear you. I don't know what you're talking about. Anything of that nature is welcome. I know I speed up quite a bit. If you're not able to hear or understand me, please tell me because I will slow down. I have this habit of flying and I don't want to fly. Unless you want me to fly with you, I will. But no, otherwise I don't want to fly unless you are okay. So I have this, I just recollected that I'm flying now. So I don't want to fly. So slow down. If you want me to slow down, tell me to slow down. If you tell me that I am too slow, that, that is also okay, I can speed up with you. So that's the DevOps section, going deeper. And that is going to be focused on these two things, Chef, Ansible, Docker, combination. Uh, the third scenario is kind of very different. It is focused on business. It is focused on customer. It is focused on use case. It's focused on understanding what does a given customer might have in their problem set and but identifying, the go ahead. Sorry, on the DevOps, are we gonna be coding at that level? Yes, you don't, ex you're not expecting you to code, but yes, let me show you. Let me just show you so that it clears. So in the DevOps section, uh, you will have exercises that will take you deeper. So for example, here, uh, you, you, we will give you code. So there are code samples already available. You will be using these and running them inside your machine. But we don't expect you to have coding experience already to begin with. That's okay. the key. We Thank don't you. expect you to know to code, but yes, you will code. 
and there are exercises and examples given already. And yes, you will have to apply some level of intelligence that I, I don't think it's a problem. If you haven't coded before, no problem. But yes, you will code. You will code. So that's the second segment. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. And then this is the uh, example that I was giving you about, uh, what was that? DevOps. Yeah, so yes, you don't have necessary, have to have beginning coding experience, but yes, you will code a little bit in, in, in uh, what, I, what is known as Ruby language, Ruby, and uh, some amount of Python, and a little bit of here and there of you know some file structures and file formats that are, you probably already know these things i suspect so ruby and python we don't expect you to be a developer in ruby or developer in python at all in fact using chef and using ansible doesn't even require a full knowledge of ruby so for example there is this article that you should read it's called just enough ruby for chef and so it basically like a one page and so just enough Ruby for Chef is this one page that is needed. I'm going to post it in Slack chat so you have it. And that is just one page of code that you need to know to use Ruby. That's the enough amount of Ruby that you need to know to use Chef. It's not, not complex, just one page. So that's this page. I'm going to, actually, this is not the right page. I should get the right page. Hold on. Yeah. Just enough Ruby for Chef. It's probably this doc. Yep, this one page. So I'm going to send that link out to you in Slack chat so you can read, but it is not scary. Not going to scare you. Just one page of Ruby, not big deal, not a big deal at all. And not much Python either. So Python is actually just like English language and so is Ruby. And so, yeah, it will not scare you. I'm not worried. If you haven't coded, no problem. We, we have run this program for soldiers who have, who have like no computer experience, like literally. Here are the soldiers that you probably have seen them in your login page show up. So these guys, you know, most of them have jobs in the technology industry. They start up. It's a, it's a, it was a different program structured differently for them, but they have done this program and these guys have, they work in our area these days. So these guys are local now. They came from Afghanistan and Iraq and now uh, exited the military from Joint Base Lewis McCord. And yeah, I'm, I'm proud to have done this for them. So we'll do more of these for soldiers. Okay. In the architecture segment, we focus our effort towards customer, understanding the problem that they want to solve and take the learning from the technology section as well as the DevOps section and apply those breadth and depth learning to solving a given problem for a customer. So we'll do case studies after case studies of various scenarios, various use cases as to how technologies can be used to solve a customer's problem. So that's the overall perspective in these three segments that we will go over as the time progresses in the upcoming 24 sessions, including today. Occasionally, uh, if you need a special session, an extra session for something that you want to go deeper, I welcome that. You want to cover something that you want us to cover and that I don't have or have not mentioned, that is also welcome. You know, there's something new technologies pop up all the time. And I encourage that you want to discuss this or study these things on your own. You bring them up with me for discussion. I will study it myself with you and we'll practice that. So it's an open structure that I want to offer you. If you are interested in something specific, bring it up. We will study. And I keep that mind open in terms of, so I'm not, don't put a rigid structure. Although I do have a structure. I don't put rigidity around the program because as you know, we are not a big gigantic university like University of Washington. We are not. We are like five people. This is a really small team. And so that makes us agile, you know, by definition. We can change and we have changed and we will. Uh, for example, the last time we had a program for Hitachi Data Systems and their program, they wanted to study how do they compete with EMC. And so that's the focus of the program. The entire program was primarily focused around that team. So we have the chief architect and his entire team in the North America attended this, this program and they changed my agenda and I was, I was okay with that. So they want to compete with EMC. 
bring it on and let's identify. So it became a strategy session as opposed to a bootcamp focused on cloud computing. So that's a different case. But we will stick to this kind of sort of outline that I mentioned, and you're welcome to modify it or add or remove, subtract, delete, create something new, bring something you know strange. That's that's totally okay. Cool. So let's begin with the technology section. We will begin understanding a couple of things. First thing first, the definition part. The definition. So who defines cloud computing? The, the, there has to be a standards body, right? Not you, not me, but some standard. So that standards body is actually NIST. This agency defines what is cloud computing. So if you go here and look, this is the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. It's a part of Department of Commerce. Uh, at least this is the most respected definition that I know of in the industry today. So let us find out and read the definition itself. And so if you go look for the definition itself, uh, here is Wikipedia, but I don't care about Wikipedia. I care about the standard. So I'm going to open it up. And this publication has moved to a different location. Fine, we'll go there. And so that is the location. This location is a PDF file that you can see. It defines cloud computing. And I'm going to paste that link in our location here. So you have access to it. And this will synchronize. By the way, these notes should synchronize with you already uh, in the next few seconds or so. Uh, you will have these links automatically popping up in your notebooks inside your OneNote if you're synchronized already. If not, we will help you synchronize this with OneNote. So you will have access to the whiteboard that I'm using as well as any links that I come up with like I just posted. And I, I will over time when I get, you know, after the session, I'll clean up my handwriting and make it typed. And so you can actually read and make sense of what I'm typing. Like I, I just wrote definition, but I will erase that and type it in later on if that is illegible. So definition I will of cloud computing, I will improve that over time. That's what I intend to do uh, once I have time. But right now, as I speak, I would rather prefer to write and my handwriting sucks. So I will convert that whenever it sucks really bad. So this definition, focuses on certain key things that, by the way, this is a good bedtime reading, seven pages long and cryptic language, really cryptic language. So it's a great bedtime reading. I mean, if you want to feel sleepy, go ahead. If you don't, you know, if you're not falling asleep easily, read this. But let us read only portions of it so I don't want you to sleep. I don't want you to sleep at all. So let us stick to the relevant operative portions and understand what exactly cloud computing is. And by the way, if this is too primitive, too boring, please tell me that you already know this and I can move on. But please do so. If you find that this discussion is too primitive for you, you should tell me so I can skip ahead. If not, I'll just cover it and at least at a high level and then move on, move forward. So bottom line, read the language here. I'm going to highlight that portion, this segment up to this point is what we should read. And so the key operative things here are, it is ubiquitous, convenient, on demand, network access. What does that mean? So let's go read, ubiquitous, convenient, ubiquitous, convenient, on demand, network waste network access. And so these are very, very simple English words, uh, convenient, ubiquitous, you can go to India, go to Zimbabwe, you can still access Office 365. It's a cloud service. It is on demand, you know, basically you pay them money and you get to access this service that you have and that we have and all of you probably already use already from your companies. Uh, if not, you some use some of the service, but these services and subscriptions are available to you and to us, and we can buy them, pay them money, and they are available. These services sometimes have downtime. Like for example, there's this mobile device management is restoring service, and the portal is restoring service. So some issues occasionally happen, and education services are degraded. Okay, <laughs> so Microsoft Classroom access is giving some problem, but we are using it. So if it causes a problem, you know, we'll go comp complain to Microsoft and they will fix it. 
So that's the idea. Using cloud services, as you know, ubiquitous, convenient, on demand, and on the network. So these are the concepts that we need to think about when we are defining the word cloud computing. Let's keep going. To a shared pool of configurable resources. What does that mean? It means that you know my services that I have from a company, a service provider, may be shared with some other people from some other company. So let's define that in, in form of an illustration. So it is shared. Shared pool of resources. Shared pool, what does that boil down to? So you have some resource, and these are customers number one, customers number two, customers number three. All of them are sharing the same resource. It's shared, unless it is dedicated, which is a different case. So there is a dedicated cloud also possible, unless it is dedicated. By default, the definition says it is a shared pool of resource, which is understood. If it is dedicated, and we'll talk about those examples later, but primarily, it is shared. Most cases are shared. What does that mean? In, in, in practice, what it means is that you have some huge amount of resource available. So let us see these are raw compute resources. So compute, storage, and network. So basically, you have uh, compute storage and network resources available that you want to share these are resources. And you want to partition these into smaller chunks and give it to customers. So let's say for example, customer number one wants to use this resource, this portion of the resource. Customer number two may want to use this portion of the resource. And customer number three, who's a large paying customer, may want to use this resource. And this is not used, this is not used, not used, not used, unused capacity. And so that's the scenario. You're using resources shared. These are compute, storage, and network resources shared by three companies, three customer companies. That's the usage model. So you are basically looking at a shared pool of resources that are configurable and such as network storage applications and services that can be rapidly provisioned. What does that mean? Rapidly provisioned, meaning I come like a new customer comes online, C4, and you just rapidly say, you know what, you want that machine? How big do you want? You want a full one, half, quarter, what size you want? I will give you the size you want by you know, making it fit what you need. And I'll just assign it to you. And the customer is happy and it is rapidly configurable. So rapidly provisioned. And when the customer says, I don't want it anymore, I'm done with it. And that is also okay. You just say, you know what, go bye-bye. We'll stop your bill and you will disconnect the resource and relinquish it, make it free again. And that resources are now available for use by somebody else. So say C5 comes along, you can assign the same resource to the, the, this person, C5 entity, and C4 is free to go do whatever they want. They don't have a, they have to pay any bill. They move on. Now, this was a fictitious example. So let us go look at some concrete examples. For example, I'll go to uh, Amazon, let's say, Amazon Web Services. So I will log in to Amazon and just give you an idea about what this translates to in real life. So I'm going to log into Amazon right now, get my password going. And my password, I'm copying it and putting it in there, logging in. And now I am logged into Amazon Cloud. Now here, if I want to get a machine from them, I'll just go to EC2, which is like very similar to what I'm describing here. And this guy, me, is going to be, uh, let's, let's give this guy some little portion. I'll leave some empty room. So this Nilesh comes along, and he wants some resource from Amazon. So the resource provider here is machine provider, Amazon Web Services, EC2 cloud service. So this EC2 dashboard, as you see here, is, by the way, uh, you, this reminds me to bring up a topic for us to discuss, which is uh, we should open up uh, accounts with these companies. Uh, most of them give us free access. So let's go see what, what we can get. And so most companies like Amazon will give you one year full access for free 
at this location. Google Cloud will give you $300 for usage. Joint Cloud will give you some amount of usage. DigitalOcean will give you some free usage. Azure Cloud will give you $100 of usage or maybe $300. I don't know what the current free trial offer is. But you know, for Microsoft employees, you already have Azure access. Uh, for uh, Boeing employees, uh, I'll tell you how you can get access to all these services. You probably have them already if you do not know. Uh, if you are a Boeing employee and you do not know, you should contact Conrad Kimball, who is your chief in uh, cloud operations. Uh, that guy was a student a while ago. And uh, he should be able to give you access to internal resources that you can play along. You have internal deployments of all these services and also private cloud known as OpenStack. OpenStack is a open source product. OpenStack is a open source product that you have deployed internally. And that OpenStack software is available from this site. And you have actually a physical private cloud deployed inside the company and you can play with it. If you don't have access to it, ask for it. You should be using, you should be using it. It's a pretty good software, open source, open stack. So Conrad Kimball, that's the name, and say hi to him when you go and, go and see him. Uh, for other people who are not in these two big companies, you have to use the free trial offers, and those trials are available in this location. If you go to this page, you will find these offers, uh, free cloud services. I have accumulated a bunch of these guys. You should go look, look at that link. And just sign up through those links. Uh, that will get you the free trial offer. And I don't have any of these available to me in our company. I already consumed them a while long ago. However, if you click through these links, you will probably see that it is pointing to some free trial. So you should make use of these things. And establish accounts. Yes, you have to give them a credit card. As long as you meet their conditions, it is not going to be charging you. It is free for first year for new customers. So that offer exists although it doesn't apply to my login because I'm already a customer for lots and lots of years. And so that is this. Then in addition to that, Google provides you access for 30 day trial and Office also provides you for your own personal 365 subscription for some time. I think they give you 30 day trial also. So we'll play with these things at some point, uh, but uh, you should you should get these services uh, and, and experiment this, all of them uh, that gives you access to cloud services. And sometimes it is appropriate to pay and get access to services uh, when you need to learn a particular thing and it is not available elsewhere. For example, there is a key scenario where I want you to spend $1 and that is not available for free. And that scenario is like this is to get a domain for yourself. Get a domain name. I mean, I'm, what I mean to say is, uh, you, you understand what a domain name is. It's going to be yourcompany.com, something like that, right? Uh, so it is going to be you. So get that domain name for your company, our company, whatever company, as long as it is available, you should get that. And you should not spend more than 99 cents. Why am I saying that? Because there are companies that are give, going to give you a domain name for 99 cents, and that's the amount of money you have to pay, otherwise you cannot get a domain name. But I do want you to get a name so you can use a bunch of services in the cloud with your name attached, and that will give you real practical experience. So let's go do a search for, uh, I think GoDaddy gives, GoDaddy 99 domain. Let's see, that's still available? Yes. So search for this phrase, GoDaddy 99 domain, and that will get you this name. So click on the advertisement for a change, and that will take you to this 0.99.com domain, and you just search your perfect name, whatever name you like, and say search, and it will get you that domain name, and it is available for 99 cents. Great, so take it. Although it is very difficult to remember that, but just saying that it is available. And so choose a name that you like, and by the way, as you go along shopping, this 99 cent domain name, GoDaddy and all these other companies will want to sell you, upsell you certain things that you may not want to buy and you don't have to buy. And in fact, I would suggest don't buy because you don't want, we don't want to use them. We just, all we need is just the name. 
So go get a name for 99 cents plus tax and do not spend anything else on that site because we don't need anything else. All we need is a name and a name server that we will get and uh, we'll connect and play with a variety of scenarios, but use your own domain name. And if you have a domain name, you don't even have to worry about this. But remember, don't spend more than 99 cents. Plus tax. So that's the name you should get. That's the money you have to spend. There is no other way I know of to get a name without spending money. Okay, the reason we're doing this is that we want to actually connect a bunch of services, a bunch of things that we practice as we do assignments and work and projects. You want to do it as if it's a real company, as if it's a real business. And so that flexibility you will get only if you have a name. And that's the name I would, and in fact, one of the one of the better ideas is that if you want to have a name like uh, some of you have, uh, which are non uh, not so popular, like Lonely.com, nobody has that name. So I have that name for many many years, and it just goes to Cloud Genius website currently. But it's a name, and so it's available. And I, I've took, I've taken it for many years ago. So the idea behind this thing is that if you go look at uh, the name and where it is currently hosted and all these things, you can find out those details by running this simple query of dig and lonely.com and then say a record. So give me the a record, it is currently pointing to this IP address and then you can search dig for lonely.com mail records and you can tell that it is going hosted on Google. So things like that you can find out very easily on your domain and you can actually experiment with your name and your DNS records all along. By the way, is this name and DNS new to you or you're familiar with it? Or if you have a domain name already, just speak out. Just tell me that you have already. I just want to gauge the level of familiarity you might have with domain name systems and internet based services and integration of these things. So if you have a name, say yes, I do. Anybody? Nobody? Nope. Oh. We're good, I'm good, yeah, I got one. You got one, okay, so that's great. Uh, for others who do not have, please get a name. Just just use a name, get a name, get an interesting name that may be interesting to you or maybe your future customer. Whatever, may, you know, family name, uh, group name, team name, sports name, whatever, works. As long as we have a name, so get that. Because what we intend to do with these names is to associate a name server. And once we have a name server, we will then associate a bunch of cloud services with that name server so that your name services will become available on your domain. So you have your person at your company.com available to you and your employee at your company.com available to your employee. I'm just saying these fictitiously right now. But the idea is to understand by doing it for real. And we'll, we'll begin with those experimentations as just to get us started, to get a feel of it. And then you will understand how large companies do it and how cloud services actually need that name to begin with to, to create and deliver interesting services in the context of using cloud. And at the end of the day, the, the whole real reason behind all this learning that we want, and I, I think this is a critical thing I want to make sure that I I clarify is that the reason we are we are doing this program this bootcamp program primarily is to do one thing what is that one thing is to gain competitive advantage gain competitive advantage over our competition that's exactly what we intend to do so how does cloud computing help us in gaining competitive advantage over our competition? That's what we want to go back to our dis definition that we are discussing right now. So here in the definition, this one, this definition actually goes deeper now in, in the context of what we just discussed. So we discussed ubiquitous convenient on-demand network access to shared pool of resources and here in the EC2 dashboard, I can always request a resource, I can launch a machine, 
and I can launch some machine image and select the size that I want. So say T2 micro, T2 large, M4 large, and then review and launch. At this moment, what is going to happen is on that sheet of paper that I'm just drawing here in the, in the portion which I was, I think I was, yeah, I lost, uh, yeah, here. So the new customer comes in, he wants to get this resource. You can actually literally do that on demand, on the fly, just click this button launch and you will get the resource. That's the idea behind resource sharing. And as we go along in this discussion that we are having here, the core concepts I think are clear. Ubiquitous, you got that. Convenient on-demand network access to shared pool of resources. We understand that part. If, if not, ask a question. Next thing, rapidly provisioned and released. So, you know, customers can walk away, they can go away and the bill stops. You pay only for what you use and you don't have to pay as long as you tell them that you don't want the service and you go away, the bill also stops. So pay as you go and don't have to pay if you're not using anything. That's a fundamental shift that cloud computing has, has brought to the industry today. Now, another key thing, another key characteristic that you should not forget is that it is provisioned and released with minimal management effort. You know, it's very easy to release a resource. All it takes is to just click another button and say cancel or maybe delete or destroy. And so that is easily possible, very, very easily possible because it doesn't require too much effort, minimal management effort. So the customer can themselves provision a resource and delete a resource without even bothering calling Microsoft or Amazon or Google. They can do it themselves, self-service. The idea is, without service provider interaction. You don't even have to call Amazon to get a machine. You just click the button, you get it. And you click another button, you get rid of the machine and you're done. So you pay only for the time you used according to the pricing for the size and storage and network and CPU and whatever else that you use, or whatever other services that you use only for the duration of the time that you consume. And then you terminate that consumption and you are done. And you don't even have to call Amazon or call Microsoft or call anybody else. You just do it yourself. That's the core concept of cloud computing defined by this definition. Any questions on the definition part before we go into deeper of models, characteristics and deployment models and things of that nature. So any questions on the concept itself? What is cloud computing? That concept. I think that is clear. If not questions. No questions? Break time. Break time? Yeah, break is good. Yeah, so five minutes. We'll take a short break right now. Uh, it is uh, 6.07. So we will uh, get together at uh, maybe 6. Uh, uh, zero, what? 17, 15? Yeah, that's a good time. 6.15 p.m. We will resume. Until that time, I am here. Maybe I'll go walk a short break, buy a break and come back. But I, I leave the whole thing like this. Even the microphones and cameras all are open, but I will walk away and come back here and do some cleanup on the notebook. So I'll improve my handwriting and make it clear and maybe delete some craft and we'll resume our discussions. And uh, in, in last few sessions, people actually take the break, like they walk away, go to, the, go to their thing. And people suggest in the past, uh, I'll let you decide what you want, but people have suggested that we not talk technology in the break because those who are missing out may actually want to not miss out. So they avoid talking technology. So we talk about sports, weather, sun, rain, Hawaii, things like that. Uh, unless you're okay, I, I'm okay. I'm okay either way. But uh, yeah, last group told us to just be quiet. Do not talk technology in the break time. Yeah, fine. <laughs> okay. So if that's the case, tell me if you, uh, need anything, you chime away and I will actually start taking a break right now. So we'll continue our discussion at 6.15. We'll keep the audio, video, everything working just like that, just walking away. Hey, hey Nilesh. Yes. Real quick. Yeah. Um, so I got a website or uh -huh. I got, sorry, I got a domain name and uh -huh. it's, and that's now saying a website, which will be the cloud that you were mentioning earlier. I should go get a cloud service. Can you please tell me what the name that you have? What's the name? Yeah, Myers Team Services, M Y E R S Team Services. Yep. 
Okay, where does it run? Do you know? I just created it at GoDaddy, so you know I don't know how long it takes to actually, you know. Yeah, so you have a name there, yeah. and so nothing will pop up. No. No, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. And because you spent only 99 cents, right? That's right. good. That's all we wanted. Yep. So what GoDaddy will now want to do is to sell you other stuff. You don't have to buy. Right. What does this do? All it does is establish a relationship between uh, ownership with you as the owner. Right. All it did was it defined Mr. Myers now owns this domain. The domain name happens to be this. That's it. That's the only thing that got established. It right. does not start any service whatsoever until you do it yourself. And that's the whole idea. So we will build services one step at a time, slowly, step by step, as we go along doing certain things. But right now, nothing will work because right. there is nothing. All you have is the name ownership. That's great. Now you need to do the next logical step, like I mentioned, is to use a name server, like name server. And most name seller will give you a name server for free. They give it to you already. The seller, GoDaddy, has given you a name server for free already. You have it. You should go find it. I'll tell you how to go find it. You should use that. That's the next logical step. So yeah. the next logical step is to go to GoDaddy, which I have an account, but I don't have anything there, but I will just show you. So GoDaddy sign in and, and I, I don't know how to show you because I don't have anything, but let's see. So somewhere in here, after you sign in, there should be a place to go find your domain. So your domains will show up here. Like Under you, domains. Yeah. Somewhere yeah. Here your domain will show up. And then as soon as you click on the domain name itself, like Mark Meyer Steam Services name, that name, this one, then it will show you another button that will probably be called uh, edit zone record or premium DNS or just DNS server, DNS services, name uh, any of yes, these. I saw up. some of those, okay. What is that? What, what's the name showing up there? Uh, like Myers team dot services for 39 bucks. No, 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 no money, no money needed, no money. No, uh, oh, manage, those are for... manage DNS, do you see something, something like that? No, I'm on the wrong one, yeah, hold on. Yeah. So share your screen if you like, so just, yeah, click the green button at the bottom, share your screen. You should be able to see it. For, for you to see the green button, I need to stop sharing my screen. So I'll stop sharing. And now you should see a green button. And in there at the bottom, there's a green colored share my screen button. So you can share your screen and I can see what's going on. Can you see it? Yeah, I see it now. I see it now. So let's go see what you're looking at. So they're trying to sell you a bunch of other related domains and we don't need any of those. All right. we need is the name that you actually bought. So the name you bought is in your products, or uh, rather not, not product, what is it called? Go to uh, your mark, the name at the upper right corner, mark. Yeah. And here you will have manage my domains. And that is the domain manager. In that uh, case, we have uh, before temporary hold is placed, verify your email address. So go do verification first. And yeah, you, you have to go, you check your email and verify that you own it. Okay. And then this name will actually show up in this page. I see. And this is not a sales page, it's a, it's a service page. I see, okay. So don't go to the sales pages. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And then that's the next step. Yep. So you want to check, validate your email with them and then the domain name will pop up in your service page. Yeah. Oops. You the only one that can see my screen? I know everybody can. So <laughs> you want to, you want to not show. Yeah. If you want to hide something, you stop presenting. There you go.
copy and paste that password. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Another good idea. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, give me a second. I'm walking away. I will be back in a minute. No problem. Hey, Mark. Yeah. This is Ram. Hey, so when you bought the uh, domain on GoDaddy, so yeah. uh, you first search for the domain name and uh, it gives, yes, your domain is available and 99 cents and then it lists get three and save 16% and you just clicked on select for the uh, the one that has 99 cents next to it. Is that, is that right? Yeah, correct. And then it's going to try to upsell you like three times through the process, you know? to go like two years or whatever, just keep going back to whatever the 99 cents option is and you can get away. I got out with a dollar 17 after tax. Okay, because that's what I'm trying to, so after that, I just clicked on continue to cart. Yeah. And go there. So, uh, no, so I have everything. Yeah, you gotta look at make sure everything is no thanks right on that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they okay. turn it upside um, bad. And it still says subtotal is nine ninety eight, and then it's yeah, right up there. So on the nine ninety eight, um, that's because it's putting you for two years. Okay. Oh, so yeah. click on that down arrow, and you'll see that it's it. one yes. year for ninety nine cents. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, don't don't spend more than ninety nine cents. Like I said, they yeah. try, boy, they try hard. Yeah, they try to hard, they try to upsell like crazy every single time. And I'm not kidding you. Everywhere you turn on that that wizard. Yeah, the thing is, if you don't create, if you try to buy it without uh, creating an account, if you go to the cart, it automatically added everything, and it has like you know, a total of uh, seventeen uh, bucks something. GoDaddy is uh, yeah shady business. I don't like them, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I in fact I have migrated all my domains to another company which is cheap but not shady. Uh so <laughs> that's the name where I have most of my domains. It's called name cheap, but they don't have it for 99 cents. So you you may want to move your domain away if somewhere else that you like and stick to them if you want to keep the domain <clears throat> for a year number two three and beyond if you want to if you really end up liking the domain name you bought you want to go to a different registrar I'm, I, I'm, I shouldn't be saying this actually yeah yeah if you like GoDaddy use GoDaddy if you like somebody else go there but this transition of migration of domain name from one seller to another seller at least uh, give it three months before you transition it is not possible to transition right now if you bought a domain name right now, you cannot just take it away to another seller. Transfer domain transfers, I think there's a block time, cooldown time of two months or something like that. So you have to wait two months before you transition it away. <clears throat> so we are back from break. And so the, the core idea behind this name business is to give us a place, a familiar place that we control 
each one of us uh, that will allow us to experiment and do hands-on exercises with real name associated with cloud services. So a simple one that you can think of immediately is to have a site, right? Website, give me a website. And so website is basically a place where it will render some HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and other stuff onto your browser. And you need to have an association. The association is as simple as something like this. I'll, I'll show you what I mean by association. You need to have a name to an address association. The name can be the White House. And the address is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Right? That's the address. The name is White House, the White House. And this association is established by the post office. They decide what name and number mapping, what name and address mapping is correct and what is not correct. So if you send a message to the White House, people will know that the address for White House is whatever that is. That's the association. Now, how is this association translating to domain names? Let's go figure it out. So we will have a name and it needs to have an address. Right? So the simple idea that we need to have is to just go look at an existing domain like I have this one. That name, right? That's the name. So let's go look at the name itself and I'm going to open up a notepad that makes it bigger for you to see from a distance. And here's the name that I use for my company. So let us dissect the domain name itself and just try to understand what it means. This is not a domain name name as such, but it's a subdomain to a subdomain to a domain. So a subdomain to a subdomain to a domain. That's what it is. And so it reads like a good English sentence, be a cloud genius, but it is very craftily constructed out of a subdomain of a subdomain. So this is the first subdomain. Actually, this is the first subdomain and this is the second level subdomain. And this cloud genie happens to be the domain that I bought with a .us extension top level domain. So this is a TLD. US is a TLD is assigned to the country United States. This is the company name. This is the domain name that I bought cloud genie. It doesn't have a meaning to it. The name of the company is cloud genius, but I craftily put a dot in there like this to construct a domain name, but that itself doesn't have a meaning. So I will construct further and keep going until I get something that I really, really like. And this is the name I use. Now, for most cases, you're not like this structured like this yet. So we will stick to this portion. And so this is the name and we want to associate this very, very quickly to an address like 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So what it boils down to is that any browser that opens up this site needs to know where does it need to go to receive and see the content, the White House. So it needs to have some IP address associated. What is that IP address? Let us go find out. So let's go do this test. I'm going to, you can run these tests yourself on the workstation if you have one, but I don't, I don't think everybody has a workstation, so it's not a big deal, but just watch, watch me do it. So dig, and then Microsoft.com. And please tell me where is Microsoft located? What is the address? So give me the A record, the address record, A. So give me that, and it gives you the answer. This is going to be a global DNS query on the domain name Microsoft.com asking for the question, give me your address. And since Microsoft is a gigantic corporation, they have five locations. So think of five different IP addresses they're going to serve globally. So global audience will reach these five different addresses depending on their geographical proximity and they will receive content 
about Microsoft.com. So I'm going to say open Microsoft.com here. So Microsoft.com, if I open it up, it pops up. The site is visible to me, and this is the closest site that is going to get to me on my machine is going to be geographically closest to the, the location where I am currently right now. And that proximity is one of these five locations. One of these sites is actually rendering the content that I see here. And that's what this query did. Dig Microsoft.com, give me the A record. You got answers, five of them. Good, let's re repeat the question to another domain. So we'll do the same question, dig boeing.com and give me the A record for boeing.com. So we'll go open up, find out the records are and Boeing seems to have two A records. So these two for the answer section. That doesn't make Boeing small, they probably have replicated it. So I don't exactly know what they're doing. All I see from outside is this, which basically means if I open a browser window and say Boeing.com, I will be showing, I'll be shown the content of the Boeing website, public facing content, and this is what I see. What does that translate to in practice? Is that we are associating a name with an address, say Boeing.com, with two IP addresses, and Microsoft.com with uh, five IP addresses like that. So this association between a name and one or more IP address is the association that you saw. So let us repeat this one last time. Dig and then my company name and you see that I am a small company compared to all these large gigantic organizations. So I will go and see what names do I get when I search for the name and look for its A record. I get one answer because I'm small. And what is that IP address? This IP address. This IP address corresponds to my 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, somewhere. And I honestly do not know where it is. I'm, I'm just being honest, because it is somewhere in the cloud. I know how to get there, but I don't know where it is, honestly. Somewhere in Seattle, that's what I know. That's all I know, actually. Somewhere in Seattle. I don't know where it is. What does that boil down to? Is that this, go back to the definition, it is basically obscure. You cannot really tell where the machines are, what resources you're using, and what that service provider has given you. You get to the machine by going to the service provider, which currently I'm using this company, by the way, for my cloud services. And that happens to be a fantastic service. I mean, unbelievably beautiful. and absolutely high performing for a very low price. And the pricing is delicious. I mean, yeah, look at this. Monthly pricing, you got a 45 GB machine for $20. SSD, 2048 MB RAM for a whole month. Great. So I'm using this machine right now, $40. And I'm gonna log in. And once I log in, it unable to create, oh, of course I need to log in, not create. So I will log in. And once I log in, it asks me for an authentication code. So I will go grab that. And the authentication token is going to be inserted. By the way, what I'm doing right now is known as two-factor authentication. If you don't use it, please start using it immediately for everything you do with money, for banking, uh, passwords, uh, for email, for uh, critical services, every single thing. Make sure that you enforce this discipline on yourself of using two-factor authentication. And if you want to listen to more of it as to how to do it and all that, you can read more about in this location. I'm going to paste a link for you and you should see that. Yeah, that one, that blog post, I actually walk you through with a, it's a podcast and a blog that, that will tell you how to do it. I'm going to just paste a link in here and there we go. So I'm going to paste this link, call it two-factor authentication. You should enable that if you don't, I think many of you already use it, but I'm just saying 
two-factor authentication, you should enable that for yourself. After having said this, let's go to this vulture thing, uh, which is a cloud service. And here is the actual machine, which is running this IP address. It is running Ubuntu OS, and its location is in Seattle. I have a bill accumulated of $9.23 up to this month. And that box run, it runs Docker containers, which is what is running this site that you look here. So taking, it, taking the discussion back all the way here, what we are doing is in our terminal, you saw me query for the domain Cloud Genius and give me the corresponding A record or address record. And it came back with this IP address, which matches what Vulture has given this Vulture server. This is a cloud company. Uh, it, it, it seems to be beautifully high performing. Nobody seems to know about them. So probably I'm, I'm the only one who's using it. And that may be the reason why it is so fast. And uh, I don't know, but it, 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 it's going really well for the last three months. So uh, that IP address I obtained from the cloud service provider and give it to my name server. So my post office. What does that translate to is something like this. So I go to the post office and I say, you know what, my name, this B dot A dot whatever dot, whatever dot, yeah, that name, yeah, use this address, 104 dot, yeah, whatever name, that IP address, associate this mapping, name, address. Once this mapping association happens, then the browser will know where to go and look for material to show. So the browsers, when people hit this site, it will, browser will be sent to this machine. That machine needs to actually show you what you want to show. So that's what a site is essentially. So if you want to go to this um, Mark team services, like here, and you want to open that site here, this one, nothing will show up because there is nothing. I mean, literally there is nothing. So you will say that, you know, what is my A record? There is this record. Now who's done it? Did you do it? I don't think so. So you don't know what's going on. So you don't want to use it. It's probably GoDaddy's sales page. That's what it will go eventually to in a few minutes after you authenticate and verify your email address. GoDaddy will probably want you to go to their sales landing page where they will sell you more services. That's by default. That's what their instinct is going to be as I can read them. So let's go see there what is going to show up. And I bet money that they will show you something to buy eventually. It's not opening right now, but yeah, that's going to happen eventually. So on your uh, email verification that you may have completed, uh, when it does, uh, the idea is to eventually change this to something you want. Uh, where do you change it? You go to the DNS control panel in the service section of your domain name and then modify the name server and tell the name server, I don't want this 184 dot whatever, but I want something else. And what is that something else? You decide. That's the idea. That's what we'll do eventually, you know, in the next couple of days. Thank you. Yeah, so keep going. Uh, back to our definition section. So here, we understood the concept of definition. Let us quickly and also understand three things. Essential characteristics. What are the characteristics that differentiate a cloud from a data center? That characteristic has to be understood, and we will do that. Uh, then we'll also discuss the three service models, the pre three primary service models that are defined in this definition and four deployment models. By the way, these days, uh, this definition is like old now. I think it's reasonably old. Let's see where it was, September 2011. So it's a fairly old definition for uh, a cloud time clock. So yeah, many, many years have passed, at least four, five. So things have changed. And so the definition may eventually evolve and may get updated. Uh, the NIST will update their definition at some point but this is the definition we have right now. So we are just using it. You may question it and that's okay. You may want to change it and make it your own definition. That is also okay. But we, what we are doing is just reading what the standards define. That's it. That's the scope of this discussion. 
So with this scope understood, let us understand the five characteristics. Those five characteristics are on this half sheet of page. First one, on demand. Whenever you feel like you get the service, you don't want it, get rid of it. Stop doing it, stop using it. That's it, on demand. Broad network access, meaning it is available on broadband as long as you are on broadband and you know broadly available globally, unless you are in uh, North Korea or uh, some parts of the world where it is not possible. Uh, apart from those places, you know, you have general broad network access worldwide. So you can access any of the cloud services. And that's the co core concept. Resource pooling, like we discussed, it is shared. Shared can mean scary things, scary. And what does scary mean here? Uh, let us understand what does scary mean. So scary basically means that you might have something like a resource that you are sharing and this is you and this is your competition. And so you may be using this machine portion, this portion, and your competition may be using this portion, another portion. On the same box, now does this sound scary to you? It might sound scary to some people. That's the challenge. When you're sharing a resource, you may be sitting on the same box with your competition and you don't control who gets to sit where because the service providers kind of obscurely define and allocate. Even they don't know what's going on to the extent they don't exactly know which customer is going to be allocated to which unit, which floor, which building, which location and which box because it is dynamically allocated through some algorithm. And they do not want people to know and find out which exact machine is where their, their services may be running because that defeats the purpose. So that's the part which is scary, but don't let that scare you. There's a decent amount of isolation from a concept and logic perspective that actually separates these guys from everything else. And these guys from everything else. So it's completely isolated, self-contained segment, absolutely insulated from anything else outside in a proper cloud. What's a proper cloud? Now think of Amazon, think of Microsoft, think of Google, big name companies take that level of rigorousness needed to isolate every customer in their own area. Some other companies don't do that. So I want you to realize that there are certain cloud companies where the backside of the same box, the internal IP address can actually backdoor access this and these guys can access that. That is a problem. And don't go to such clouds if that is a critical thing. Don't do that. And so that backdoor access is quite easily possible on certain clouds and I will tell you and show you documentation at appropriate time from those cloud services that have this problem and they acknowledge that they tell you that this is a problem. So beware of it. And so if that's the case, don't go there. Don't take your business there. Unless you understand what it means and you are able to prevent any bad situation yourself in your control. And that's okay. In that case, you can still use it. But just realize that big companies actually go to the extent of providing a complete isolation to address this risk or perceived risk that people have, which is resource pooling. Hey, it is shared with my competition. I don't want to go there. Don't worry. It's okay. It's, it's quite, quite clean and quite segregated between your and other people's accounts. It's actually pretty darn solid isolation. You don't have to worry about it. Having said, the next idea is elasticity, rapid elasticity, meaning here, the idea is to grow and shrink. And I will, I will illustrate this point in a different piece of software starting up right now. And here it is. So the, the idea is that if you have some machines like this one and you are going to run it right now. So let's say, you know, you, you have this, this, uh, platform where you're going to install and set up one machine and you want to allocate that one machine and that's great. And you want to have this customer of yours that you have, this guy, 
let's move that aside. So this customer wants to access your services. And so he or she will come and visit your load balancer. And then through that, it will access your service that you want to run here. And it will access some database on the back end. And so that scenario is possible. Right? You want to now scale up or scale out. I'll explain both these scenarios. I just said two words for you. The two words I said were scale up and scale out. Let's understand both of them and understand what it means. So let's do make it bigger is what these two means actually practically. So let us begin discussing this part first. So we'll discuss this section, scaling out. And by scaling out, what we want to be able to do is this machine, we want to get more of the same. So we'll just copy that rapidly and create more of the same. And this concept rapidly growing like this, as and when we feel like, when we want to serve more customers because these customers will pop up, right? More customers, more demand, and we can grow and scale out rapidly. That's the rapid elasticity expectation and a key characteristic in the context of cloud computing. Similarly, the opposite of scaling out is also possible, which is scaling back in. So it goes like this, it just go away. So you relinquish your resources and make it small or grow your resources like this. And so you're growing and adding more resources as your customers grow in terms of numbers. So when customers grow, you will have more people like this hitting your services, tons and tons of them. So this box alone cannot probably possibly handle your traffic, all of this traffic that people are hitting. And so you want to supplement that with multiple machines that will serve your customers and these customers will be happy. And so that happiness can be ensured by scaling your infrastructure accordingly. And you can comfortably scale out to make it big. And the opposite of the same phrase is to be able to scale back in. You can call it scale back in or just scale in. Scale in, scale out. That's the model of scaling like I described. And that is a key characteristic in the concept of rapid elasticity. You can grow and shrink your infrastructure at a moment's notice, almost programmatically. You can write code to make it big or make it small and we will do some of these exercises at some point. So that was this discussion, scaling out and scaling in, right? What is this business? Scaling up. Let's understand that part. So I'll clean up right now, just a minute. And get rid of these guys here. Yeah. Oh, not that one. Okay. So scaling out, we understood. We get more of the same. So for example, this was a 2 GB machine with 100 GB hard disk. Yeah, we get more of the same and just copy and create more of the same to serve our customers who are growing in numbers and we can solve them. Great. Now the other discussion, which is scale up. What does that mean? Scale up basically translates to something like this. You have a machine and you have this, sorry, you have this uh, customer who now needs a bigger solution. So you can scale up like this. That's the concept where you are making a machine itself bigger. So this was to begin with a 2 GB machine with 100 GB hard disk. Now it is a 50, you know, 64 GB machine with one terabyte SSD. So you just made it big. That is called scaling up. And the opposite of the same phrase is scaling down. And when you want to scale down, you're basically going like this. That's the idea. You go back to decrease the size of the machine. So scale up and down is basically make the machine bigger and smaller. In scale out and in, 
you're making more of the same and less of the same. And you can do a combination of the two. So you can scale up as well as scale out at the same time if you like. And those are the key characteristics of elasticity. You want to be able to provide a response to your customers and keep them happy. Imagine this scenario where it is, you know, a day after Thanksgiving and uh, Microsoft is going to come out with a new product. Let's call it the Surface product. I mean, just, just saying it's not a new product anymore. But yeah, the new product coming out and you know that the demand is going to be heavy and people are going to buy tons and tons of these products. So you need to be able to scale your infrastructure and your Microsoft store that you have. So Microsoft.com. You know what I'm talking about, the place where you buy Microsoft stuff. I think it's called store or Microsoft. I don't even know what the name is. But that store that you sell. So sign in, that should be the store. Store, yeah, there. Store home. So yeah, this store I'm talking about. So this site needs to be scaled out. And automatically it does scale out when there are a large number of people hitting. And when there are less number of people hitting the site, it shrinks back again, makes itself small by itself because it is actually looking at characteristic of the network of the CPUs on all these machines as to how many people are actually hitting. Uh, so you may, you may have, you may get a surge of customers like, you know, lots of people will come and show and start hitting your site. In that case, you need a systematic programmable method for your infrastructure to scale out and back in comfortably by itself. And you need to write code for that. And that's what Microsoft has done. That's what many big companies do and even small companies do because it is possible. And so it is technically possible to actually implement that scenario very, very effortlessly as well as without breaking the bank. That's the key. The key is without breaking the bank, even a small company like ours can do it. The problem is that people don't know how to actually implement. And that's what we are trying to learn. So that's one of the things we learned. Uh, now, back in, the, in, in our discussion here on this topic that we are talking about, elasticity is be able to make it big, make it small. Make it big, make it small, both directions. I hope you saw my hands as well as the illustration I draw. And one key characteristic, which is measurement. This measurement basically means that you will get a bill because the provider is going to turn on the meter and start measuring how much are you using. If you use more, your bill will become more, bigger. If you use less, your bill will eventually shrink. If you stop using, your bill will become zero. Zero actually. And that is the key five characteristics. So on-demand self-service, broad network access, resource pooling, but don't worry about it too much unless you are in a properly constructed cloud like Azure, like Google Cloud, like Amazon Cloud, and some other companies actually do it beautifully. But some others are not doing it the way that they should be doing, but they are giving other value like cheap machines for access, really high performing, cheap, but they don't worry about too much about security, right? So you, they leave it to you to deal with it. And so if you know what you're doing, it's a great idea for small companies. And here is one example, not this, not this, this. Digital Ocean. It's one of my favorite uh, cloud providers. Uh, their pricing is pretty dramatic. You will see that similar to Vulture. Same thing, monthly pricing, $20, $40, and, and hourly pricing is ridiculously cheap as well. Uh, basically, same thing translates. And they don't worry about security as such. They don't even have the concept of what is known as a security group in Amazon or a virtual network in Azure or something like that. In, you know, in uh, Google, they have a concept of a firewall. So the, they don't worry about these things. All they give you is raw horsepower and just take it for cheap. And so if you know what you're doing, great, go ahead and take it. If you are worried about security and privacy, you have to deal with it yourself, you're not ready for that, then go to a properly constructed full service cloud. This is cloud in the sense that it is, but it is not 
as secure as expected as you would expect from a large established corporation that provides cloud services it is not and they tell you right up front they're not hiding those things it is very clear very transparent and i should tell you it is my favorite cloud until vulture came along 3 months ago in which you know both of my favorite both of my favorite by the way so they are my favorite because i find it very cheap and i can make use of it and program the way i want and i understand my own security so i don't have to worry about uh, you know internet uh, attacks and things of that nature and so we will we will discuss security related aspects and we will specifically deal with it in this cloud so we'll know what kind of threats exist and how to mitigate them because if you go to a full flesh cloud they will protect you already so you don't know what to do with because they are you don't have to worry about because they're doing it for you but if you want to learn a raw deal is a better way to learn the deal and then when you know the thing you can then always go back to a full flesh cloud like you know I, i mentioned these three and these three by the way are uh, where are those so amazon is one azure cloud is another google cloud is another joint is also a good one i think samsung samsung acquired them if i remember right let's go see samsung just acquired them if i am not sure samsung joint yeah samsung acquired them so they are now a part of joint uh, joint is now part of samsung uh and uh, azure you already know uh, aws you already know google cloud is already you probably heard of but if not your gmail will give you access to google cloud any gmail including the cloud genius uh, email and it is not available for me for free trial but you will get a free trial and so i am not eligible anymore so let's close that but these clouds are available i have a full service but uh, i don't have the free offer which is not a big deal you have it uh, now uh, these four clouds i mentioned are actually full service they give you proper uh, structured well structured security this digital ocean does not and that is something that i think is a great example for us to learn how to improve security around ourselves if you want to run out in the wild in the jungle how do you protect ourselves and that that's the reason why i keep using that cloud because it is raw deal it's just a machine out there on the internet with open to attacks so you are afraid if you are afraid don't go there but that's not the idea the idea is to learn how to protect ourselves so we'll do that security perspectives and so uh back to the definition closing out on the topic that we discussed five things five key characteristics let's move on to the other aspects like service models service models so in a service model what this basically means is that you have some resource and you want to deliver that in form of a service to a customer and so you can deliver the service in form of infrastructure then it becomes infrastructure as a service if you deliver the software that you have as a service it becomes software as a service if you have something else xyz that you want to deliver it becomes xyz as a service and basically this this is a fancy uh, method of bullshit as a service you know if you are bullshitting and providing bullshit as a service i'm just a joking just giving a joke but the idea is you provide some service to somebody you just call it as a service and it becomes cloud service that's the idea i don't think so so the 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 definition goes into defining three different service models and those three are software as a service and this is you probably already use it all along you've been using it all the time and one very well known service is this software as a service known as office 365 and right there uh, it doesn't look the way you want to see because i am looking at the admin view uh, but uh, let me just open up office 365 as a service and this service gives you a ton of services as you know already you know that it gives you access to the office suite of applications uh, calendaring email skype for business online meetings file sharing sharepoint workflow management goes on and on like it's a it's a long laundry list of services and these used to be 
software that Microsoft used to sell like a decade or two ago. And over time, over the years, Microsoft has transitioned itself into a cloud-focused services-oriented company. And it is happening, you see it. And here's an example, a famous example that all of us use already. And this is software from Microsoft available as a service, SaaS. You know this already. I don't. I, mean, I think it is too trivial for, for you probably. So I'm going to skip this discussion. Another one, google.com slash A. This is a place to buy Google Apps for work. So pretty similar competing with Office is these set of services available from Google where Google provides most of these services uh, to customers who, and we used to use this for the last three or four years, maybe more. And uh, we just started using Office 365 also. And the beauty that I found is that we can actually integrate the two. And that's what I ended up doing just five days ago, literally five days ago, that I have an active directory centralized login system, integrates with Google, integrates with Office, and all integrates with Cloud Genius. And all these integrations I uh, succeeded in just five days ago before the start of this class. So it is the first time you're seeing this integrated login system where we are basically saving you the trouble of having to remember multiple passwords. We still have to integrate one more, which is Slack, which is still like hanging off on its own, but uh, we'll decide that later, not right now, next year maybe. So software as a service. The, the fundamental business idea underlying this concept of software as a service is like this. Customers who used to sell their products, like if you remember 10 years ago, you go buy office in Staples, it will be priced at $550 retail. So yeah, people will buy that software, install it on their laptops, desktops, and use it and feel happy about it. Now, how many people do you practically know today that are willing to spend this amount right now on an office product? I don't think anybody knows, wants to spend that money. And Microsoft understands it, customers understand it. And so people are not spending this money upfront. Not anymore. They want to pay as they go. And so that is where this software, this office software has converted itself into a service, which you can buy for, I think, six bucks a month. I don't know exactly the pricing is, but let's go find out. So the pricing is, what's the pricing on there? So pricing is available to you $5 a month. Beautiful. I can afford this, spend $5, keep going. And so that's the idea. So for businesses, uh, essential program, you can get this. Uh, higher level programs, you can get these. And even higher, you can spend more if you have more money. And so that's the core idea behind And so Enterprise E5. Uh, that is a probably $20 per month. $35 per month per user. And so you can get that subscription and you can get full-fledged Office, like the Microsoft-like services for Cloud Genius. And I'm going to buy this one pretty soon. Uh, but let's see, at appropriate time. I'm not ready for all these services because I don't need them yet. I want to need them, but at that time I'll buy them. Uh, so the idea is to be able to use these services and not pay upfront. Upfront pricing hurts. Similar examples from other companies, like you know Adobe software. Adobe used to sell their premium master collection for $3,000. They still sell it for $3,000, but I don't think people buy that kind of uh, licenses anymore. So Adobe has transitioned their services to what is these days known as Adobe Cloud, Adobe Creative Cloud. And I think the pricing there is about $20 per month. Maybe for student pricing, there's a little bit less. But the idea is don't pay all this money up front. Spend a little right now and pay as you go, use and go along. And that's the concept of using software as a service. So the definition reads like this, is to have the applications being accessible from a variety of devices, meaning you can use Word software, that Word that you have here, this software, you can use it on a Mac, use it on a PC, use it on iPhone, use it on, I think Android also. So yeah, just anywhere you feel like you can install the application and use it. 
and it is a pay per use license. So per user license per month you pay and, and that's how you go. That's the concept of using services like software as a service available to you from the service provider and you don't have to spend a whole lot of money upfront and you can keep using it and you can ideally use it just through the browser by the way. So I can go to say uh, portal.office.com somewhere here and I should be able to start Microsoft Word inside the browser. You probably know this already but I'm just showing you. Here is Microsoft Word starting up in a browser window and click to open a new file and I can just edit right there. And I can edit this file, save it in my OneDrive and it is Word Online. This is classic software as a service where all I need is a browser. This is classic. And yes, I'm dealing with full-fledged Word document and I'm editing without having to install anything, just using it. And that's the beauty that is possible today with online services, full-fledged software available in the browser. And that's the concept of software as a service. And so, you know, can you name some others? I've given you like three or four examples. Give me, give me some three more examples that you know already that are different uh, from what we just discussed as software as a service. And I think this is very trivial. So I'm going to skip this unless you want to go deeper. There's nothing to go deeper in here actually. So it's just software available to you. So the other aspects are interesting. We'll get to that. So any examples? Just shoot a couple. Google Docs. Google Docs, Salesforce.com, Workday, Siebel application, SAP. All of these are now services. Yep. SAP, the huge gigantic $80,000 software is now available for $9 an hour right here. You can go and launch an instance with SAP in the marketplace and let us go see if you can get SAP there. HANA. And there is select SAP HANA and you get to pay how much? Hourly? Yeah, $3. Even cheaper. There we go. So $3.09 per hour, including the license and the machine. And you start SAP HANA. You know, I remember I used to be working for Siebel Systems a long time ago, year 2000. The pricing of this software was so expensive that even the setup required a couple of months to get it right. Just the setup. So I get the software and then set it up. Took, took two months. Right now, it'll take less than a minute for me to get a full-fledged SAP HANA running. And as soon as I click this button, I will get it. So that's the concept that has completely revolutionized how software is being used and delivered as a service. So this is one example. You can see more examples like, you know, Dynamics CRM from Microsoft, Dynamics CRM. Now and this, yeah, classy and sweet. Yeah, so you have tons and tons of such examples of uh, companies that are old style software companies have evolved themselves to become software as a service providers. And that's what this, particular service model is and I think you understand it. So I will skip this platform part for just a minute and first discuss this infrastructure as a service part which is also very very simple to understand. But let's discuss this infrastructure piece first before we discuss the platform part. So I'm going to open another sheet of paper and here describe some of the concepts that most of you probably know but I'm just drawing them out to you. So at the very foundation of any computer system, you need some, you know, hardware, some silicon, right? Some silicon, some board designs, uh, some uh, CPU, uh, GPU, things like that. And, uh, you know, these, these providers of, of manufacturers of these components will eventually get together to make a reference design and that will make a machine and on that machine you will run an OS and then you will run some additional binaries, additional software and then on top you can use an application. And this is your software. Can you ask a question? Yes. So for um, in the heavy transactional space for a database, how are they managing the uh, 
storage for these because you know sometimes that transaction requires you know some heavy duty back end requirements to support those is that part of this yes so uh, by the way who was that person asking question i i'm, I'm still listening for your sounds so i can familiarize myself but was that there is. this is david hi david so answer to your question precise answer is here so let's uh, go to the example the answer to your question is coming up so it is about high intensive io operations right so let's go pick an operating system i'm going to pick this one and select a machine type a reasonably big size so let's say this one is uh, what 16 cpus 16 cpu that one is a good one let's go select that and i'll go configuration details and here i will uh, add some storage that's the area if you want to discuss right storage that's so correct storage and let's understand this so here in storage if you need high performing storage there are three levels of storage systems available in amazon and we'll we'll, we'll find similar examples in other companies also but this is just a quick example you can select the size of the hard disk itself you can say i want 100 gb not 8 gb okay you can also say that you know what i don't want this general purpose ssd but instead i will get some high performing ssd so get me that one instead so get me provisioned io per second provisioned iops ssd and here i can decide how many iops i want to support and that will decide you know my pricing my disk becomes expensive but then at least it is high performing and on the other hand i can go down to magnetic disk which is really bad disk i don't know who uses it i don't even know why they have it anymore but they have it and you can get a sucky disk like this i don't think i recommend that don't nobody takes it but they, this option is available as magnetic disk but don't use that use the general purpose for most cases and when you want a high performing io situation you want to improve your io throughput you get a better machine connected like this and a better hard disk and you can even adjust some of the io performance requirements that you might have so you can probably increase uh let's say how much max throughput you can get uh let's try to increase this number to say 10000 and let us see if it let us yeah it it lets us get a higher performing io per second and more io means uh more money bigger bill but the possibility is there for you to select a better performing disk and connect it directly to your machine that is going to run your high performing transaction systems and it will work so that option is available it is expensive though and they will charge you a decent amount for that but for for purposes that require that kind of a business use case that option should be selected for most dominant use cases like mainstream applications this is a good enough solution for general purpose ssd which gives you about 300 io per second for whatever your use case is that's great you know it works most cases so is that that magnetic probably is for non-transactional type of situations? Uh, for transactional situations, I would recommend a a provision guaranteed IOPS. So right. No, my question was: so the magnetic stuff maybe was for non-transactional type of uh, backends? Yeah, magnetic should not be used. It is yeah. just there because they have it. It's but just, it's yeah. Yeah, I I don't even know if you sign up uh, for the service from Amazon. I don't even know if they will show it to you. I have this Amazon account for the last seven years. And so uh, AWS account for the last seven years and the Amazon for, I think, 18 years. Uh, but the AWS account, I don't think they, you will see magnetic. I doubt you will see magnetic if you open a new account today. Okay. I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. So I see magnetic. I never use it. And I would recommend you don't use it. It, it, it is the pricing is same between a general purpose SSD and a magnetic. You don't save money. So why bother? Right, right. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, cool. Proceeding ahead. So the stack that I'm building all the way from silicon all the way up, up to the application level, we, we have a software available. So this is the software. And the next logical step here is to be able to eventually get to software available as a service. Now, in order for us to jump from software 
to a software as a service scenario, there are certain things in between that are needed. And that is what I would like to talk about next. So a new sheet of paper and let us understand I have software and I want to provide a service called software, my software as a service, this service I want to render and give it to customers. And so I have the software, I am the software developer. So I need some underlying hardware, I will run this software on and then that infrastructure that I will need, I will probably want to use some infrastructure as a service so that I can scale out and scale back in my application and make that application available to my end user, which is this guy. And so I want to keep them happy and I want to give my software to them as a service. And so I need some kind of an infrastructure that I want to run. And so I am going to get that infrastructure as a service from somewhere I can get like Amazon, like Azure, like Google, or maybe other companies like Vulture and DigitalOcean and other places. But this gives me a machine. It doesn't do me anything else. I will have to still set up my application, get my underlying dependencies running, get my uh, anything else that I need to run to make sure that everything that I need for my software to run correctly needs to work on top of the machine that I'm getting from the service provider. And then I will have my software running and that running software when I give access to the customer, that's what software is available as a service is practically is. So if you want to enable this scenario, you need to do certain things in between, like set up all the dependencies you need so that your application will just work and then scale out, scale back in. And for that to happen, you need something that is generally known as a platform as a service. That's where this platform as a service comes into play. So there are many companies dedicated to building, developing, and providing a platform to people who are customers. So let's identify that business dynamic associated with this. And so I'm going to clean up this drawing a little bit and illustrate the concept that I want to talk about is to how money flows. So infrastructure user, who uses infrastructure? So the money uh, is basically, uh, you spent by the platform developers. So these are platform developers. These are software developers that make the software and they want to give that as a service. So this software is owned by the software developer. They want to provide it as a service and they will pay money to the platform developers like this. The money goes down to the infrastructure developers. and the money flows downwards. The services will flow upwards. So infrastructure as a service will become available to the platform developers who will consume the infrastructure and create a platform that they want to sell to the software developer who in turn will run their own software to create a software as a service and then sell it to the customer. So this customer will use the software as a service and pay money. So the customer pays them money. The money is flowing downwards. The services are flowing upwards to the customer all the way. So these are the layers that we saw and that we're looking at right now is the underlying infrastructure as a service is basically providing us access to compute, CPU, storage, and network resources, and some security environment for us to play under. And then somebody has to deploy the underlying dependencies on the machine to make it a platform worthy of running our applications. That is a platform. And that when it's available as a service, it becomes platform as a service. And you use, you may want to use, or you may want to create your own platform as a service, like companies like Microsoft and Amazon and Google. They don't go after creating, uh, go after a platform vendor. They just build their own platforms on top of their own infra infrastructure. So large companies like these big names do their own stuff on themselves. 
they don't have to go look for a platform as a service solution. They will build one themselves. They, they know what they're doing. It's a, it's, a, it's a clear scenario. For other companies who are focused on software development, they may want to consider outsourcing other work that they don't have to do. That's the core idea. The core idea that I actually have described it somewhere in our dashboard where you will find the cloud technologies segment. And in the second video, which is like a minute long, this video is where I actually describe the concept of this, this that I'm talking about right now. And you will watch it at some point. The concept essentially is, by the way, uh, uh, Diego. Uh, this is a Michigan professor who unfortunately died six years ago. Uh, but he was there uh, when I was there and I learned from him. He, he, he's, he coined this word that you probably heard of. Most of you already know it already. The word is core competence. This word was coined by Professor Prahla, who is a famous, who was a famous, still a famous professor, uh, Professor Prahla CK. He wrote a book on this topic called Core Competence of the Corporation about 27 or 30 years ago. And that word is now very popular in the industry. Everybody just throws out the word. What's your core competence? But what that basically means is the bottom line is that <clears throat> you should do only what is your core competence and rest everything else should be given to somebody else for them to do it. And that's the essence of cloud computing, by the way. When you're looking at a company like Microsoft or Amazon or Google and another company like Cloud Genius, I don't think I have the competence to actually manage a large scale infrastructure service. Meaning I don't have the, the core competence to manage an infrastructure for myself. So I outsource it to somebody else who is going to manage, give me the machines that I need anytime I need and scale them out or scale them in as in when I want to. You, you saw the scaling discussion. So this infrastructure, I don't want to deal with myself. And so I outsource it. Whenever something that I don't want to focus on, which is not my core competence, I will get rid of it to let somebody else do it. In another example of the same topic, the idea is if you are a brain surgeon and it is Saturday afternoon, nice and sunny, and you have a lawn behind your home and the lawn is like growing and you want to mow the lawn and you have a neighbor who has a teenager son who is doing nothing and you know him and he knows you and you're well buddies. And so if you want to mow the lawn and you're a brain surgeon, should you mow the lawn or should you hire the teenager? What's the answer? What do you think? Anybody? Hire the teenager to mow the lawn. You got to. Time yeah. is money. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, right? To hire the teenager because teenager is probably going to do better than you, than you. given uh, your surgeon, you know, you're a brain surgeon, you probably are not accustomed to lawn mowing. However, what if it is a Saturday? and you have no brain operations, nothing else to do, and it is nice and sunny. You may want to do it yourself, that's also okay, it's not, not a big deal, but if it is work hours, and you're supposed to be in the hospital, you better outsource that, right? That's the idea. You outsource whatever is not your core competence to other people, to other companies, even to other countries, like outsource uh, you know, random phone call answering to India. <laughs> <laughs> that has happened. And I think the, the, those people are coming back to this country apparently because I got tired of those Indians answering my phone calls, support calls. Uh, it, it still is a prominent business because Indians can speak English apparently. And I don't know if the other people can understand them, but they can speak, it seems. And so people have outsourced. And there's a famous movie called Outsourced about uh, the same, same concept of call centers. So core competence basically boils down to you outsourcing anything that you don't want to do, that you don't necessarily know exactly how you do. So you are building software, that's great, 
So you focus on your all your energy on building the software in a Git repository and keep it ready for deployment. That's all you should do and not worry about anything under the hood because that's not the idea. You should stick to what your core competence is, which is to develop software. And that's what you should do. Outsource the rest. So all these things, platform maintenance and dependencies and all other riffraff, let somebody else do it. You stick to your software and deliver that as a service. I know, you know, we have a gentleman here, uh, Ram. He is a software developer and he develops software for a company that uh, I let you speak about your company. I'm not uh, going to disclose what you do, but at the end of the day, he, he built software, his company built software and they want to deliver it to their customers. And so it may be a good idea. I think you already do it that way is to, you know, don't do stuff that you don't have to and identify a solution that will do it for you as long as it is affordable and economically viable and technologically practical and possible. So with that understanding, these platform as a service vendors provide you, you as in this guy, the software developer, a platform to just run your applications. So you have an app, you give it to the platform service vendor and that's it, you're done. And we will have an exercise just on this topic coming soon, pretty soon, where you will take an example application, it's going to, it's given to you, you will use a platform as a service provider and then run that application on the platform and it is trivially simple. It might sound complex to you, but it's not. Let's understand some use cases of these uh, three things like I mentioned here. So Nilesh, we have, uh, yes, quick, question. quick question. Yes, please. Uh, so like software, I understand it's the like uh, Windows 365 thing, um, uh, infrastructure, hardware, what is that platform uh, tangible way? Like, is that your middleware stuff? Is that I'll, like I'll your- I'll show you an example to illustrate that just now. So I, I, will, I will get there. So I know okay. this, this, that, that's why I skipped the platform as a service part to invoke that question. So I succeeded. So yes, so software as a service. I also have another relevant question yes. for uh, platform as a service. Yes. So uh, from what I understand, platform as a service is something uh, in order for your software to run, what dependent software, uh, what dependent tools that need to be uh, uh, be available on the uh, server or the environment, whatever, yep. Yep. Uh, right? And so for the for e, for each software, the uh, requirements are different uh, that uh, that are required on the platform are different. And uh, so, is it the software uh, SaaS uh, SaaS provider? Uh, provides their requirements to the uh, uh, platform providers, platform vendors, uh, so that the platform vendors will build their, uh, build the platforms for the software providers. So a short answer to your question is, anything that helps you bridge the gap between infrastructure and software, anything in between, that is platform. Whatever it takes, to make your software run. Anything in between the two, software and infrastructure. In between whatever that thing is, is the platform for your software. For everybody's software, the platform will be different. Slightly, sometimes dramatically, but it's going to be different. Every software has their own dependencies, their own requirements, so it will be different for every application. Every software will need some variation. However, there are commonalities. So we'll go look at a classic, classic platform as a service, well known in the industry today. Uh, it is, I think, one of the leaders. They are Heroku.com. This company is industry leading platform as a service solution provider. What do they do? Let's go read. They say that, you know, bring your applications and they can be in JavaScript, Ruby. Let's go look at all the Ruby, JavaScript, Java Virtual Machine, PHP, Python, Go language. God knows what this thing is and God knows what this thing is. But yeah, it's, it's closure. And this is what? Uh, Scala. 
this is Go, this is Python, this is PHP, this is JVM, I think, yeah, Java, and this is Ruby, and this is JavaScript. So bring your application in these languages, give it to us, and we will run it. As long as you generally follow a standardized way of writing applications, it will work. That's the guarantee that these guys have. So if you look at uh, the scenario as, as they illustrate here in this, this drawing that they're trying to draw, you know, all you do, you don't worry about get straight to building the applications. Just focus on building your apps, not on infrastructure. Like infrastructure can be scary. And Lord, don't let that scare you. We'll go deeper in this complexity ourselves. We will go and, you know, yes, you will hate me for that. Uh, you might, who knows. And the idea is to let this value proposition be simplified so that application developers will just focus on building applications. And that's the key value that Heroku provides is that they don't want you to worry about these things. The complexity of provided by, you know, the challenge of managing the infrastructure is kind of hard. So they give you a simple solution. Just build your app, give it to us, we'll deal with it. You pay us $33 per machine per month. That's, I think that's the pricing the last time I checked, but just check the pricing again. The pricing is, if you are a standard or professional, it is $25, that's cheaper these days, apparently. $25 per dyno per month. So the machine is called dyno, uh, for dynamo or some, I don't know, for some reason. The name they use is dyno. And so it's basically one machine. Uh, it can be a bigger machine, so it will be $500 for bigger size machines, uh, smaller size machines, $25 at the lowest for standard size. If you're a hobbyist, it is $7 per dyno per month. If you're a freebie, they also have a free account. This free account is what we will actually make use of uh, in the exercise that is coming up soon. So that's this solution that we will use. But the, the scenario is that you don't have to worry about infrastructure. That's the value proposition of a platform provider. You focus here, let us do the rest. Don't worry, give us your app. All you do is a git push, git push and we deal with it. So, uh, Nilesh, again, uh, yep. a little confusion here. You, you say that they will Can you say your name before you ask a question? I'm, I'm still Sorry, learning Mukesh. your voice. Uh, Mukesh here. Ah, hi. So you were saying that they will provide the infrastructure. I'm still not positive. Like, what is that platform portion of that thing that they will be providing? Okay. What is the so I think it's best illustrated with an example. So I, I illustrate this answer with an example. So the example is this. So let's say if you have a Ruby on Rails application, right? So Ruby on Rails is a very well-known uh, product, open source. It's available, uh, not here, but uh, Rails. So Ruby on Rails is right here. So let's go understand. If you're developing an application using this tool, you need to incorporate certain underlying things to make it work correctly on a platform as a service. What does that mean? It translates to, by the way, this was the tool used to build Twitter and GitHub and a bunch of other big companies have built their foundation on this tool. Uh, this, if you go to look at the documentation and getting started, and read the assumption, it will specify what is needed from the underlying platform. So for example, it says you will need Ruby 2.2.2 version or newer. You will also need uh, some database. So SQLite is one database, you can use Postgres database, you can use SQL database, you can use Microsoft SQL, MySQL, Oracle, this and that, some database. And you need to define what database you will actually use and have that database available. So for this specific example, the Rails, what you really need is an underlying machine, an operating system, the Ruby language, and then the Rails uh, package from that site, and some database, and some gems. Gems are basically Ruby packages that you will use in your application. 
So as long as you have this definitive collection and then you add your Ruby Rails application, it will work. That's the idea. I'll give you a couple more examples, similar things. Another good example that I would like to talk about is a very well-known application called WordPress. This is another famous open source project. Uh, it is downloadable from this location, wordpress.org. You can click on it to download, but our idea is to not download, but instead understand how do we use it. So we go to the documentation and read, how do you get started? So you install WordPress, it requires some dependencies. So what do we need? So things we need is the software itself. And then, uh, Actually, I, I just know, I don't need to read it from here. I know, I know what the dependencies are. So to install WordPress, the application, you need four things. It's called LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. The PHP is a language you need to have you need to have a database. You need to have the Apache web server, which is also open source, and Linux as the OS, which is also open source. And you need to have these things running on a machine. And then you install this application on top, and boom, it works. Let's see one more example. The example is Drupal. This is another very well-known application in the open source. The White House runs Drupal. Don't go to whitehouse.com. Uh, do not uh, go to whitehouse.gov, not org, gov. Whitehouse.gov. Go to the site, which is the White House, and this site runs Drupal. Drupal is open source project. Uh, this is the source for Drupal and you can get the documentation will help you understand what do you need. And so for example, this documentation will tell you what is needed requirements, system requirements for Drupal, and it doesn't go into detail, but I know the requirements are again the same thing. You need Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, and instead of MySQL, you can use PostgreSQL. That also works. So every specific application will describe what exactly you need as the underlying platform for the application to run correctly. And this definition description comes from the application developer themselves. They will tell you what is needed to get the app running. So we saw three examples, Rails application, WordPress application, Drupal application. And like this, there are tons and tons of applications in the open source. And you might have your own applications, in which case you will know what is needed to make your app run. And whatever it needs is the underlying componentry that is needed to make the platform work. Now, if you go back to the platform as a service, which is this example, Heroku. Now here, do they provide you in the Heroku platform, do they provide you? Let's go look at PHP example. So we were looking at the PHP example here. So I'm going to click the PHP button and read what do they provide. So they tell you that you need to basically give us your PHP application. They will give you a PHP runtime and also give you a database. And underlying uh, it, you know, the, the machine needed. By the way, this Heroku business that they have here, it runs on top of the Amazon Web Services EC2 infrastructure as a service. And they run their Heroku platform as a service on top of the Amazon infrastructure. This is these days a salesforce.com company. They got acquired by Salesforce a while ago. So it is now owned by Salesforce this Heroku platform as a service. And all you do, if you're a PHP developer, for example, is to put your application on top of this platform. They will give you whatever is needed to make your PHP application run. For example, the Linux machine comes from here. 
uh, the uh, Apache and uh, Apache and PHP elements come from Heroku. Heroku also provides you with a connector to connect with some database like MySQL connector or Postgres connector. These connectors are available in Heroku as a platform. You will see them when you use them. And uh, once you have them hooked up, then you can you know, install your application that is written in the PHP language on this platform. And the platform will give you Apache, give you PHP runtime, give you database connectivity, and it runs on Amazon EC2 cloud which gives you Linux. So you have the entire LAMP stack ready. And all you do is just put your application on top and it runs. And you will see it running. And we'll see tons of exercises on this topic itself. And yes, you may use platform to begin with, but we will get down dirty and actually use the underlying infrastructure directly and use uh, uh, the, the in the DevOps section, we actually go and, and skip the platform and deal with infrastructure directly. So just to understand what it does, what does it take to build out the whole thing all the way from scratch, from nothing out of literally thin air or thin cloud uh, to get a raw bare bones machine from you know any service provider, any of these guys, you know Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and build it up on all the way top to the level where you can construct and deliver a service to your customer for your application that you might have, or you may use an application from the open source domain, or you create your own. So one of those scenarios. So platform as a service essentially is a service available uh, from companies like Heroku is one. There are others such as Engine Yard is another well-known uh, platform as a service, uh, which is, started as a Ruby platform as a service, but they now have other services also. So tons of services even they have. But these are the old style, uh, old established uh, names. Uh, relatively newer names are Azure. Azure is a great platform as a service. Uh, they have it already, you probably know them. Uh, if you haven't used them, let me just show you what they have. Azure, you can just go and deploy your application very, very comfortably. Let's see if I can log in and show you a quick example. They might have it. Where is Firefox? There it is. And let me log into Azure. Uh, what's the login URL? Manage dot, yeah. So it should take us to Azure. Not this, I want to go to the other. No subscriptions found, so sign out. And now sign in as a different user and now I'm going to log in where I have a subscription and get my password going. Where is my password? Uh, no, this is my password. So copy and log in as me and Enter. So now we are logged into Azure, and you will see that inside Microsoft Azure, it used to be called Windows Azure, uh, but the URL is still the old one. It still says Windows Azure, but there is a new portal. You can go to the new portal if you like, but I want to quickly zone in on the platform abilities. So here, you can just say quickly new and say, I want to use uh, a web app and quick create uh, something. I'm going to give it a name, Cloud Genius. I hope that name is still available. Yes, and I will create a new service plan and go to the West region and create the app, as simple as that. I can also go and uh, create cloud services, mobile services, and th these are uh, ready-made uh, solution. You can even custom create a specific thing that you want. So you can select a database if you want. You can get a free SQL database or a paid database if you like and establish a connection string and you can create a new service plan and establish a name for it and then you start defining what you want your application to be doing and you can publish from source control. What this translates to is a git push. And we'll talk about Git, and yes, you will use Git. Uh, Git is a source code control system that is open source, Git SCM, as you know already. And uh, this is now a part of Visual Studio. 
if you go to Visual Studio, which is a Microsoft tool. I think I'm talking to Microsoft people. Why do I talk like this? So you know Visual Studio. <laughs> Many of you are Microsoft employees. So yeah, Visual Studio now incorporates Git, as you, as you already know. Uh, so if you go to product uh, and yeah, here. Git is included as a part of Team Services. Uh, Visual Studio Team Services has Git right there. And so uh, it is full-fledged first-class citizen in even in Windows land. Uh, of course, it, it exists in the Linux world already. So that's Git. And you will basically take your application, give it a name here, and define a database connection string, and publish from source control practically means you will do a Git push to Azure. And you push it to Azure and the application will go live. You don't have to worry about machines, don't have to worry about dependencies because they will take care of it. They'll take care of your database, uh, your services that are needed to make your app run. So that's one, that's one scenario. There are many, many scenarios available even in this company. Let's look at some other companies also and we'll get to using them also at some point. Uh, let's go look at, uh, where is the Amazon example? Okay, let's open Amazon example. Amazon also is a platform provider uh, where you can literally take your app, give it to Amazon, Amazon runs it. Don't have to worry about machines. Uh, where is that thing in this complexity? Uh, it is fairly complex uh, in terms of it interface, but there is a place where you need to go look for, and that thing is, uh, it seems to be called something different. What's it called these days? Mm -hmm. It used to be called Beanstalk. I don't know. There it is. They moved it here. So Beanstalk. So you go to Beanstalk, and uh, here, what you need to do is create a new application. You give it a name. Go next. It creates the application. And here, you create a web server environment, a worker environment. You create a web server and you select what kind of language you will use. So here, you can say pre-configured with Microsoft technology, IIS, great. You get automatic load balancing, automatic scaling, everything pre-configured. You just click and proceed, and you deploy your Windows-based, IIS-based application, .NET application on a 64-bit on a Windows Server 2012 R2120. If you want to change the OS, you can, like this. You can change whatever OS you want, but yeah, I will stick to what the defaults are. They're probably good. Now, if you don't want Windows, you select Java, and there we go. You automatically get a default Amazon Linux machine, this version of OS, and load balancing, auto scaling, all provisioned for Java, and all you do is take your Java app, jar file, and push it to Amazon, and it runs for you. Same thing here. Go to Node.js, you write your application in JavaScript, you get a Node.js environment on Amazon Linux ready and load balancing, auto scaling, all working. Beautiful. Run it. It runs for you. You don't have to worry about how many machines you need, scale it out, scale it back in. No problem. It does it for you. That's a platform. Another case PHP. And here we go. We get PHP loaded on our Linux box and auto scaling load balancing. Same thing with Ruby, Tomcat, Go, and Docker, and Python, and multi-container Docker, and so bunch of different solutions available. These things essentially are platforms where you are not worried about what the underlying machines are because they are worrying about it. So you outsource, it to, outsource the worry to them, give them some money, they'll do it for you. That's the idea behind a platform, the core core idea is to run and manage your applications. Let these guys deal with the infrastructure, deal with the platform dependencies. They'll maintain patches, maintain your requirements that you define, and it will give you a scalable infrastructure. Scalable as in this type. And Nilesh Mukesh once again on that. When you said patching and OS and all that. Uh, I, I'm coming from a place where it is highly dedicated uh, system, large but very dedicated. Uh, so my understanding of cloud is a little low, so that's why those questions. Uh, what about the the infrastructure upgrades, like when they are doing uh, software upgrades? This is a fast-paced industry, so you know things become old quite quickly. So 
what happens when they have to do the OS upgrades or let's say a Java version upgrade or the web server upgrade or a database upgrade in, in between. And you are sharing those kind of infrastructure on the same machine. How are those impacts? Yeah, so uh, the promise that these platform providers have is that they said that, you know, we will run your apps no matter what. So under the hood, what they do is something like this. And I'll show you an example. So let me clean it up. Under the hood, uh, let me uh, you know, get rid of these machines here. Oh, I think I made a mistake in typing too quickly. Okay, so kill, kill, kill. Okay, so let's see we have this machine and it is running some version of Java, some version of the operating system and now you want to update the underlying operating system, reboot the VM, and update the version of Java involved and things of that nature. So you need to do that. I mean, they need to do that. And you are running your app for your customers are right here. These are your customers, right? So they will want to visit your site and your site runs on this platform. And you don't exactly have to worry about all these things under the hood because all you're doing is saying that, you know what, Amazon, or you know what platform as a service provider, take my app and run it for me and keep it running and keep it scaling out as needed. Scale it out as needed like this and scale it back in as needed like this. When my customers go away, I don't need any more machines like that. Scale it back in, uh, scale it out as needed. So that will happen automatically like this. So you need to do this work for me. I don't have to worry about anything inside this red circle which is like a black box for me. But the question that you have is, how are they doing it internally? What is going on under the hood? That we need to know before I venture and put my, you know, my business online with them because I need to understand what are they doing? Are they really capable of doing that? So let's understand that thing. What are they doing under the hood? So let's go one machine at a time. So we are trying to understand what would they do and how would they go about doing it in the example cases of Let's begin with one example. The first example I would like to take is update the operating system. So this is your load balancer. This machine is the main workhorse. This is your database machine. So three layers. And this all of it is in a black box. So let's say, uh, or rather I should call it a blue box. So all of this is in a blue box. You don't have to worry about what is inside the blue box, but we will. We'll go deeper. So if they want to change the operating system here, what they would do is on the fly, create one more. And have you, or rather have your customer divert the traffic to that side and let it go like this. While at that time, they're going to update this box bring it up to speed on the latest version of the operating system that they want by even rebooting if needed because reboot and downtime is totally fine as long as the customers are not even bothered because they can continue to operate on through this method which is an alternative route and they can bring this machine down reboot it kill it get a new one no problem they're doing it for us as a service so that's the value that platform providers provide is they cut down time from our customers perspective. They, not that they don't have downtime, they will, they might have insight, but we don't, we don't know. So in fact, the claim uh, that cloud companies claim, at least, at least from a, from a market facing perspective, Amazon EC2, let's, let's go see what the claims are, EC2 availability. The claims from EC2 availability, SLA, the claim is, What's the claim? Yeah, 99.95, that's the claim. So here, monthly uptime is 99.95, uh, less than 99.95, but equal to or greater than 99%. They will give you some service credit. And yeah, that, that's kind of lame. But yeah, that's what they are committing right now. So publicly committing this, uh, that if the SLA goes down, overall service levels are pretty darn good in many of these cloud services. Uh, although they're not 100% uptime all the time, they will go down 
you know that's a fact of life biggest of best of companies go down so that is going to happen and in the example that i'm discussing right now they are doing downtimes and updates and patches for you as a service by creating a separate set of machines that they will operate on while your customers keep working through an alternate route and once that update is finished when that work is done in that scenario they will bring that machine back online and let your customers go the other way so this update finished and they can now get rid of this box and continue your business so the update happened now let's say another example so uh, it this is wrong so it doesn't matter what triggers the uh, requirement of the updates right so whether it is the software uh, the uh, software push that requires this new updates uh, in the platform or in, uh, well not infrastructure in the platform uh, and anything could trigger that but it's the same uh, uh, concept will apply yes the triggers can be internal and external sometimes intrinsic so you know three three ways so internal triggers so amazon decides or the service provider decides i want to update so they can do the update like i just described right the external trigger meaning you tell them i want to change to this operating system version not that operating system version so you are dictating the terms so you want to say that, not this but that so they will do it for you so that's the external driven trigger a third trigger may be a security patch that you know linux pushes out i want to push this to everybody like worldwide so they will push that update security updates happen in uh, you know windows in linux in mac everywhere so the service providers have to take that update because it's a critical security update like for example this thing came along a while ago what was that name hardbleed you know that hardbleed yeah yeah so hardbleed came along everybody's panicking and then you know through a quick update to open its libraries uh, everything is back to normal and so how was that possible if you are managing infrastructure through automation like we will do in the second segment and you will see that in real example how do you use ansible to keep your machines up to date and keep your services up to date if you are in the business of providing infrastructure services or platform services you will you, you will find those scenarios very interesting and you will will play through those scenarios first hand in the context of uh, this example like we are talking about if you have uh, the case where a a customer is asking hey please update me you can actually do that yourself and i'll show you how it's very affordable here is a simple way to do it very very simple let me go back to this white paper and open a new one and so practically speaking as long as the application is not way too big like you know we are not talking about boeing's commercial uh, deployments so let's talk about a reasonable medium sized company in in practice medium sized companies can pull something off like this so you have application let's call it application number 1 that you deploy on a platform and you have given it some dns name let's call it application 1.company.com and now you are pointing that name to this platform and that's where your application 1 is running that's great now tomorrow you decide that you don't want to run this version of os but instead this version 1 that os you have you want to change it to version 2 of the os and so what you can in practice do is set up another platform as a service with the same application running here on a different version of the os keep it going bring it up go live by just changing the dns and you can do that change by saying you know what dns you better point to this and you go live because that is not pointing to that one anymore you just change your dns and so this a1 name for the company is now pointing to the second platform as a service deployment that uses a different version of the operating system you just did it yourself and once you did you tested it you went live and now you can say that you know what i don't want to use it go bye bye i'm done with you i kill it and i stop the bill and i'm all done update updated 
So that's how a small to medium sized company can actually pull it off without spending too much money. Nilesh Mukesh once again a follow on question. What about the, the, the customer who is slow in upgrading themselves and they are not keeping up with the pace of the the upgrades coming up in the market like Amazon and all are moving to a newer version because of whatever reason, but the customers are still not upgrading to keep up with that. Uh, does that scenario come up in this? Can, and how, can you define who the customer is in this example, like so the A1 software, company? Software. The, 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 uh, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. I see. Software provider. I see. I see. The software so, yeah, provider yeah. is not keeping up with the pace. I understand. I understand what you said. Let me understand the question. And where I am coming is, if, like when you said Boeing type of example, yes. uh, I'm coming from there where things takes <laughs> five, ten years of a cycle to do, yeah. even in software world. Yes, yes. So let me give you a Boeing type example. So you have Boeing Commercial Aviation, whose customers are Emirates.com, mm -hmm. and you know large airline companies. They are your customers. And you have Boeing Commercial Aviation. I'm just picking that example, right? Mm -hmm. so you run the Boeing uh, app, right? Boeing Commercial Aviation Services, or whatever that name is that you have. Mm -hmm. So this is the app. Let's call it the app. And this is the customer, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't want to change the OS. Don't change my OS. Don't. They don't want to change the software quite often. And the software has to keep up with the everything else changing. I know, I know. So the, 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 uh, there are certain changes that you have to take. I mean, there is no question about it. That's what was my main along. question. Okay. Hard bleed comes. You have to take the change. Otherwise, you will die. I mean, literally. I mean, your company with business will go down. The machines will go down. That's not a good thing. So there are certain changes that you just have to shut up and take. There's no question about it. There are certain changes that you can possibly afford to not take right now, maybe next month, maybe next year. So you can push those changes slowly over time. You can bring that scenario of a slow scale of change because you don't want to bother Emirates. You don't want to bother your big airline company customers who get upset if you change things on them. They'll, they'll call you and say, you do, we don't want your planes, we'll go to Airbus. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so this is Mark. So, so, so this is Mark. So they're not running in virtual machines then essentially and can't continue to exist on these platforms even though say the platform service offering has to change, you know what I mean? To, like isn't there both, both models where Amazon offers, look, a base platform that you're gonna run on natively versus on virtual machines or you can do and launch these virtual machines on top of right as much hardware as you can scale across mm -hmm. right? so, yep so the, the 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 example of you know boeing style gigantic established big companies and big applications and big customers is a different game altogether and that's why Boeing is betting money on a variety of strategies. They will have their own data centers running in the company to run the applications. They will have another team focused on using the public cloud and experimenting with how it rolls out. They also have another team dedicated on running your own private cloud in the company firewall boundary inside, like I mentioned, OpenStack. So they're yeah, experimenting. Very good point right there. Yeah. Extranet, intranet, right? The client right. server. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. The so mix. They are experimenting with what will work for themselves. And I think that will eventually lead to a good solution for their scenario because, you know, from outside, we don't really understand these details. Like, you know better than I do from an from internal perspective. And so the bottom line is you have to really plan for what your customer is. Like in the example of Boeing, the customer is companies like Emirates. They will rule. I mean, they will literally, they, they buy the planes like it's jump change for them. Uh, you know Emirates, right? Uh, the sheikhs in Dubai. Uh, <laughs> they, they carry, so they carry jump change and, you know, uh, they, they'll buy planes like, uh, like nobody's business. And they dictate. So that's the primary customer base uh, for Boeing. And the Boeing cannot mess with these customers. Otherwise, um, you know, Airbus is right there. And so... From, from Boeing's perspective, uh, they have to understand which application sets will need to be run internally on their own platform, their own hardware, on their own boxes in the data center, and they will manage it themselves. I mean, that's, that's a given. They will keep doing that probably for the future until they find a better solution for that scenario. For certain applications that are more suited to a cloud-based deployment, they're probably by migrating them already to a cloud deployment. 
companies like this, I'm not, I don't exactly know what Boeing does, but I know kind of sort of because I deal with a lot of Boeing employees, uh, is that they are identifying a, a systematic method of which applications are worthy of going to the cloud right now. And let us take those pilots and take them in the cloud and see how it works out. If not, we'll bring them back. And that is a learning exercise that is happening in any kind of a migration to the cloud for applications that eventually get rid of the underlying physical resource, which is very, very hard to manage. Data center management is, again, the core competence, not of Boeing, by the way. Managing data centers is the core competence of companies like Microsoft and Amazon and you know, Google. Those companies deal with this every day, left and right. They know how to manage a data center. That's the primary competence, if I will say that, in, in managing software, managing infrastructure, hardware. That's what these companies do. So that's the reason why companies like Boeing, their core competence is making planes fly and succeed all the time, every single time. That's the goal. And so they want to stick their core competence in making commercial aviation, military aviation, all these, all these things that they do possible and not worry about cooling a data center factory floor or something like that, right? So the eventual strategy would be to find the entity that has the core competence to do the work that is probably not the right set of competencies that Boeing wants to keep. And that's what you're seeing in cloud computing in across the board in large as well as small companies is people are identifying what should I do that I do the best. And then I will only do just that, not anything else. Everything else is kind of sort of irrelevant to my main business. And my main business should be, like in the case of Boeing, to make planes and provide services around the planes to make them fly successfully. And everything else is probably not my core competence. So let's find out a way, uh, an entity that has that core competence to do that job better than I can, more affordably than I can, and let us find them to manage our services, like IT services, for example. So that's why you see in you know impact of huge cloud computing resources being invested in the Boeing company, and just Boeing is just one example. You see it across the board in every industry, even inside Microsoft, you see you know, teams that don't use cloud are using cloud, you know, transitions happening, you, you see that all the time. You know, smaller companies are finding much more easier to adopt and compete with larger companies at, at a scale that is never heard of, because they can literally by click of a button or run of an API call, get to a scenario where you can run whatever you want on your cloud, like I was showing you this, where is the Amazon example? Yeah, uh, here, no, not here. Where did Amazon go? Yeah, just any cloud, you know, just pick a cloud, click a button, get a machine, run the app, it works. In fact, here, this, this app that I run, it runs the site. I can take this entire application and take it to a different cloud in 10 minutes. No kidding. 10 minutes, and by the way, you as a customer will not even see any downtime. You will see transition happening magically. It just goes away from this location to that location. And under the hood, it takes me 10 minutes total end to end to take the entire thing down as a copy into my machines here in the office, start a new cloud in another location in another service provider and push the content over there and start the services in that location. And then when that new location is running to my satisfaction, I change my DNS to go from here to that. And you as a customer will not even notice that I migrated. Because under the hood, it takes me 10 minutes, something goes wrong, I just move. From Vulture Cloud to DigitalOcean Cloud to Google Cloud to Amazon Cloud to Azure Cloud, I, I don't care. Because it is agnostic, because all I need is underlying dependencies that I manage inside Docker containers. So as long as the underlying thing can run Docker, I don't care what they have underneath because all I care about is Docker. So that, that's a different scenario. Uh, you cannot apply, you know, you cannot Dockerize Boeing applications at this moment. Eventually it will happen around one day, but Boeing applications are gigantic. And, uh, you know, sometimes these are monolithic, you know, massive. 
So we need to break that application into smaller uh, service oriented components and run each of these services in microservices inside containers. That's a long term strategy that I think many large companies are taking on, including Boeing, uh, but that is not easy to accomplish. So for smaller companies, it's very easy. It is easy to just port the application from A to B without affecting the customer at all. And that, that's the kind of a, the story that we will. So uh, I think we are approaching, we, we just crossed the time. But I don't want to take too much time, but just want to say a couple of things. If you do not have access to any of the things that I mentioned, please come on Slack chat and point it out because I will fix it. So you have this Slack chat with me. You can just find Nilesh and chat with me anytime. I will go and fix all the gaps that you might not have access. I will fix that. Yeah, I will make sure that you can access the dashboard. And in this dashboard, you should see one, the cloud technologies program. This should show up already from most of you. At least David doesn't have it yet, so I'll fix that part. But if anybody else is missing, please tell me, I will fix that also. So that should be easy for you to access. And uh, we will meet again. I think the next time we meet is what? When is the calendar? Third Thursday. Uh, 15th. Thursday five. Yeah. So 15th is when we meet again uh, at the same time, which is uh, five o'clock. And let me make sure. Yeah. So uh, one thing I wanted to point out to all of you is sometimes I forget to record. Don't make me make that mistake. Don't let me make that mistake. How do you do that? You look at the Zoom conference, the Zoom video conference that's going on, and somewhere in there, you will find a red dot that tells you that the session is being recorded. And if you don't see that, please tell me, because I want to record it, because I want to give it to you, a copy, which I will, and I just noticed that it is recording, so thank goodness, <laughs> I did not forget to record. Do you see that red dot there? Yep. Okay. On the top uh, green bar. Yeah, if you do not see the red dot, yeah. it's a warning because I actually want to record for you. So I have recorded this, which is like a three hour long uh, MP4 file, and I will create a new folder. I'll just show it to you what I do. So in, in uh, my computer, what I will do is create a new folder right now. Uh, somewhere in the finder window, I will go to my BitTorrent sync folder and create a new folder, which is, I will call it uh, G-A-G-A-N. That's the name I want to give, which kind of sort of means cloud in Hindi. Uh, I've been using these Hindi cloud names for a, for a while. So in this folder, what I will do is now share it through the BitSync, BitTorrent Sync. And that's what I intend to do. So I will take this folder and drop it and then create a sync link for you. And so here, is a link that I'm going to copy and then paste it in our notebook. So here in the notebook from the instructor in the welcome section, you will have at the bottom, maybe a new page here. And in that new page, you will have a link to videos. And in that link, you will have this. So click on that thing. It will open up an empty folder containing nothing, but the name will be Gagan. And that Gagan name will uh, look like this. Oh, sorry. It currently has nothing. So this is the empty folder. And I'm going to create a new folder in there, like a new file in there somewhere. I'll say, save this file. Hello. And I'll save it in that folder. So you will have access to it. The, the primary idea is to be able to create a shared folder, which I push video content in there. So this hello.txt file I'm pasting in that folder, which should pop up in your computer as soon as I save it, and there it is. So you should have that folder and the hello.txt file in there, and that folder is where I will publish my video. So I have shared it with you. You should see that note link in OneNote. Through that, you can click and open it, Git, BitTorrent Sync, this will sync the Gagan folder, which contains nothing, just one hello.txt file that says hello. And in that folder, I will drop the videos as we go along. And that's what my plan is. So I have uh, all my machines connected already. And your machines will also pop up in the same location. That should 
just make sure that you will receive videos that I will place here. So in that file, what I'm saying is I will say video recordings here in this folder for you. So it's easier and faster for us to transmit videos. Our videos can become large. And so you don't want to wait for the video. That's why we have this method of synchronization. It works out beautifully, by the way. So you should receive that. Uh, uh, sorry, you need to go and click the button that I have given in this location. You need to click that thing. Otherwise, you will not receive any videos. So you need to do that on your computer. As soon as this synchronizes, you should see that link. Click on the link. And then it will request you, request you to set a folder location aside, which is called Gagan, G-A-G-A-N. And that's where videos will pop up. And any other questions before we hang up and continue our conversation on chat, uh, where I will enable access for those who are missing. And any questions? Nobody? So far, so good. Thank you, sir. Thanks. So how did we do? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, thumbs up. Good. Big thumbs up. Good, thank you. See you again. And if you need hey. to just uh, call me, chat with me, either way works. Yeah, uh, it's Dennis here. To, uh, I tried to refresh my OneNote uh, online to, uh, on the welcome page. I couldn't get that link. Yeah, so let me, let me uh, get a one-on-one -on -one session with you. Can you share your screen, please? Uh, yeah, just one set.